Ah, oh, we're live. Yeah. Hello. Welcome, everyone. Welcome. This is Oz Property Investors. I'm going to call it Freedom Formula Wednesday. It doesn't quite fit. Um, it doesn't quite fit into an acronym or anything like that, but Freedom Formula Wednesday. Already. <laughs> <laughs> bottled the intro already um so welcome everyone we have uh steve polisi and bushy martin and jeff miles he is uh it's his birthday so he's going to be kicking back and relaxing um on, on this fine day but uh how are you bushy welcome great to have I'm you i'm awesome guys and uh, very privileged and humbled to come and join you you've got an awesome fraternity and a great community sharing some great stuff which is uh, pretty rare in our industry so i uh, feel very privileged to come along and have a chat to you tonight guys Yes, absolutely. Yeah, nothing behind a paywall. Like it's it's very much, uh, and that's what I love about what both of you guys do. You give out a whole heap of information and education on this space. But Steve, how are you, mate? I'm really good. I'm currently in Brighton, UK, as you might know, Joe. So yeah, that's yeah. why there's been bright, bright lights behind me. So no, it's good. Loving it up. Hence the name. Hence the name. <laughs> Um, cool. Okay. Well, let's get let's get into our little quotes. We want to um we want to. I know you're big on big on mindset, Bushy. So let's let's start with you, mate. What what's your quote of the week? Yeah, I, this is my favourite one, guys, and it's one by Jeff Olson. I don't know whether you've read the the Slight Edge. It's a it's a, a really good book that puts uh, life in perspective well and truly. And given I'm a an architect, you'll understand why I, I like this one so much. But uh, it's life is a curved construction. Time is the builder. And your choices are the architect. Nice. I can get behind that. Like you can, that. You can see what, you can it. see why I would like it, but it's yeah. If you want, <laughs> yeah. If you want me to put some color around that expression, uh, when we say it's a curved construction, uh, growth in any, any direction is exponential. If you look at nature, if you look at business, if you look at investment, growth is always exponential. And then ex yeah. that exponential curve can go one of two ways. It can it can grow upwards, or if you neglect it, it can it can go in the re reverse direction so you uh, would and time is the biggest uh, component that will influence the outcome of sustainable success so that's why it's the builder and your choices obviously the choices we make on a day-to-day -day basis determine how effective uh, that journey is so uh, it's always sort of resonated pretty well with me that one yeah, on, on the flip yeah. side of that bushy, I saw the other day that death is also exponential as well. And people kind of sometimes forget that with their investing. It's like you age a lot more from age 70 to 80 than you do from 30 to 40. Oh, no. Good call. Good call. <laughs> cool. I think that's death falling coming in our seat. It's everyone's, it's everyone's for this. <laughs> the Grim Reaper yeah, didn't like that comment. Oh, uh, my phone called, so it disconnected me. Goodbye, phone. <laughs> <laughs> okay, my one, my little life hack. Mine is um, mine's from everyone's favorite uh, childhood story, um, Alice in Wonderland. Um, and it's <laughs> I've gone from it this academic a, bushy one to Alice in Wonderland. Good. Yeah, I've gone from we're going from highs to lows here, yeah. but it is um, if you don't it, and like there's a whole sequence around it. But it's pretty much if you don't know where you go, if you don't. Well, okay, now I've got to get it. If you don't know where you're going, any road is going to take you there. And um, I thought this would be quite a poignant point for our sp uh, session today. It's all about goal setting, all about strategy. Because yeah, if you if you don't know what's happening, you don't know where you're going. It's you can go anywhere, and you see it happen all the time. Um, you must, you both must see this so many, so often in both of your businesses. All the time, all the time. It's all about the <laughs> property, and got no clue what the property is supposed to be doing for them. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. Okay, cool. Well, pop your questions, everyone. Welcome, great to have you, everyone. Oh, do I here. want to get a quote? No. Okay. <laughs> sorry, well, his quote was so good. I thought he, I thought it covered both of yous. So yes, sorry, Steve. <laughs> this is why we need Jeff. Jeff is probably watching this. Come back, mate. We need you. <laughs> Steve. What's your quote? All right, I read mine on the back of a toilet door, and it yeah. is: "There's two ways to be wealthy." One is to make more money, or yeah. two is to lower your expectations. That's true. Both yes. are good. Okay. Both are good. Okay. And that was on the back of a toilet door. <laughs> no, it wasn't. I saw it on Facebook on a meme or something. <laughs> same, same place. Same place. <laughs> <laughs> okay, perfect. Well, let's uh, let's jump into our let's jump into our first sponsor, and uh, and then we will introduce the man, the myth, the legend that is uh, that is Bushy Martin. So let's hope this uh, this works. 
Selling a property. It isn't something we do every single day. There's actually more involved in the process than you may initially think. Like, how do you find the best agent? How do you ensure that you're going to pay the lowest fees? It's not easy. And then also throw in all the stress and pressure of selling. And that's why Scott Agate, a former real estate agent and expert property negotiator from Hello House, has created his leading agent finder service. After a 20-year career managing agents himself, Scott has personally conducted over 3,000 property transactions along with running Three Bell franchises. He knows all these agent tricks. Scott has created an in-depth five-step process for his leading agent finder service. First, he establishes the true market value for your property, he uses a triangulation method to shortlist the leading agents, creates a competitive environment for those agents to send through their best proposals, vets those proposals, and then he negotiates the best agent fees for you. This ensures that you're not only getting the best rate for selling, but most importantly, you have a leading agent on your side selling your property to maximize the end sale value. Oh, and did I mention this service is completely free? If you'd like to know exactly how Scott runs his five-step leading agent finder service, he's detailed it with the link below. Or if you'd like to speak with Scott to help find you the leading agent in your area, book a call today. Selling property. It isn't something we do. Every- Perfect. There it is. Hey. Okay. <laughs> Smooth. Everyone heard that? It worked? Yeah. Happy okay. day. Okay. Good. Okay. So Bushy Martin, let's, let's introduce the big man himself. Um, so for those that don't know Bushy Martin, um, where have you been? Um, check out every single podcast out there. He is on it. Um, so Bushy is an investor, a founder, author, media commentator. You are one of uh, Australia's most trusted property experts for investment, but also lifestyle. So your career now, I don't know if I've got this hundred percent correct over 35 years as uh, I spend over 35 years um, and have a portfolio, an international portfolio over 12 properties. Um, you've sought after innovation, practical advice and insights for property investment, lifestyle and finance. You are the founder and uh, what are you? Founder and property finance expert at the firm Know How Property. And you're also the weekly podcast, podcast guest for Get Invested. You were nominated not nominated, you were named Australia's top 10 property specialist from Property Investor Magazine in 2017 and awarded Mentor of the Year in South Australia by the Advisor 2020. Bushy, what have I missed? What is, no. what, this, <laughs> Coming it well, mate. Coming it well. That, that, that's the official version. That now, now we need to get to the uh, get down and dirty version, which is basically with a name like Bushy, I'm a, I am a boy from the bush, which is probably fairly self-evident. You've only got to hear me talk to know that I'm a boy from the bush and uh, had spent most of my early days traveling around the uh, country areas of Victoria and South Australia. I've been, been a gypsy ever since. I just love to travel. It's sort of uh, become part of the itch, but spent, had a fascination with property from a very early age, actually. Uh, yeah. And, and that led me into the architecture and the project management arena. But uh, so architecture is a... You- how did you get into property? Like we always like to ask that initially, like how did you actually find property as a, not maybe not as an investment, but just as a thing? How were you first? Yeah. Well, yeah. So I I was a very sickly nerdy kid, Joe. Uh, I I was a shocking chronic asthmatic. So I was a punk chested runt uh, when I was at school. And uh, because I had such bad asthma, I used to spend a lot of time uh, at home in bed, actually. I did three, three out of five days, I was generally, for, for quite some years, I was wow. crook as a dog. So I always had a pen in my hand and I was always designing things. I just couldn't help myself but, but draw. And it just, I uh, good at art, but the old man always said, yeah, that's very nice, son, but you've got to get yourself a real job at some point in time. So I thought, well, how, how can I combine my love of creativity and art with, with some sort of practical com- profession well and architecture was the obvious choice so uh, so there was a leaning towards property and the reason I went down that road at the time was that my old man uh, at, at, around that sort of age those formative years he used to spend his weekends driving around uh, buying blocks of land and then then s- on selling them and before he had to settle on them so there was a bit of a bit of an interest of, because I was spending the weekend driving around with him I sort of got a bit of a flavor for it and the yeah. architecture was the first exercise but the architecture is a, a fantastic profession, but a lousy business, guys. Um, it's a, <laughs> what, what I describe as the uh, Van Gogh profession. You sort of eke out an existence while you're doing it. 
and uh, you're generally not famous until you're dead and then no one cares anyway. So, uh, so uh, uh, that, that I was sort of up to the eyeballs in property during that period, of course, working on everything from residential, did a lot of tourism developments. I did the Yers Rock Resort uh, up in Alice Springs. I actually lived out there on site for a couple of years. Uh, I'd spent oh, wow. some time up in Thailand, uh, ran, a, ran an architectural practice in Perth for a period, uh, and then uh, came back to good old Adelaide to um, uh, head up what was the Australian Construction Services Division when we privatised it and sold it off to a, uh, a private engineering firm, GHD, which you may have heard of, Steve, if you're in the, in the uh, engineering uh, game. I've worked, worked with them many times. Yeah. So, uh, and and then I then of course I had the I was working seven days a week, fourteen hours a day in those days. This is this is back in the uh, mid nineties, and yeah. uh, I uh, burnt the bridges. I wasn't very happy. I was I had no time for work. I lost my marriage. Uh, pretty much lost everything at the age of thirty three, and had a bit of a ground zero moment. That was like, okay, well, uh, I'm not going to do that again. How, how am I going to change things? How am I going to put my energy into things that's going to give me an income without requiring me to work seven days a week? And property was the obvious choice at that point in time. So that, that's, yeah. that's where the journey started anyway, Joe. What, what project in the architectural space, um, out of curiosity, what's your favourite, like what's your most proud moment in the architecture space? Yeah, well, Ayers Rock Resort. I mean, it's uh, five resorts in one location. Have you been to Ayers Rock? I've been to Ayers Rock, yeah. I don't know about yep. the resort. I don't know if I went to the resort, though. Didn't go to the resort? And where, where did you stay? <laughs> I was very young. I was very young. Okay, okay. Because <laughs> I, I, I uh, spent about two and a half years there, I think. And uh, it's, it's awesome. It's basically designing a town. Because it's Yalara is a township. So there's a township. There's five different accommodation houses there. Uh, so uh, I had carte blanche really to completely reshape the place. We spent, uh, it was uh, in excess of 75 mil at the time, completely reshaping the place. And I, I actually lived out on site there for a good couple of years doing that and uh, drove a, a team from Perth. We, I had uh, 30 odd architects and interior designers uh, in our Perth office, but I was pretty much based on site making it happen. So uh, that, that, that's probably my most interesting uh, project that I did. And I, I did the convention centre in Adelaide as well on North Terrace, if you know Adelaide, uh, back in, in those days. So, uh, and then I had, had some great fun doing some tourism developments up in Thailand. I spent some time up there as well. Anyhow, all, all, all over the show. Found Bushy, some of those skills have translated in your investing. Like, have you used them to effectively have a good result with your property? Yeah, fundamental, actually, Steve. I, I, I'm glad you raised that. They're very transferable. And I, th I think the thing that's made such a big difference to, uh, you know, the enjoyment we've had with property is that as an architect, and, and Steve, you'd know this as, a, as an engineer, you always start with the end in mind. So uh, we're very good at visualising what the end result needs to be and then working backwards to look at, okay, what do I need to do now that's going to end up giving me that result? So that's been very useful. The uh, project management and coordination skills have been really good because you become very good at that side of it. And I've got a really good knowledge of time, quality and cost when it comes to the, the industry, which has been very beneficial in being able to assess opportunities on their merits to see whether they really fit so yeah it's it's, it's been a, a great booster in that regard yeah so w when you stepped into property investing what was your first what was your first purchase like i'm hearing you planning structuring designing like i've i see like you you've gone straight down the development path to create this work of art or you know what was your first property investment well i'm going to talk about in two cents and i call it the uh, there's there's bc and ad so there's before my midlife crisis and there's after the divorce. So, and they're two very different results. So if I talk BC, which is before my midlife crisis or my early life crisis in my early 30s, uh, my first uh, personal development was a one into four uh, uh, apartments or townhouses we had designed and built in Alice Springs, would you believe? And uh, I reckon I would be fair to say I made every mistake you could possibly make. I mean, that so, was your first uh, deal. That was your that first, was that, that, first You know, I, I was an architect, thought I knew it all, actually knew enough to be dangerous. I mean, I'd, seriously, uh, I had no clue. 
So uh, because we're going to design these award-winning exercises that we're going to, you know, be worth a million, completely misread the whole thing. And, and if I look back on it now, uh, you know, if I look at developments, how we assess them in, in this day and age, it's all about the numbers. Well, we didn't meet the market. We overcapitalised. We, we had a syndicate involved in buying it and that's that's like being married to multiple people so that that's you know nine times out of ten that ends in divorce because you worry more about how you're going to get in and how you're going to get out uh so uh, if if there was a a great learning curve that was a great one to grind my teeth on because i think we just about made every mistake possible in doing that exercise yeah bloody but, BT, yeah. but but if i talk ad after the divorce uh, my abilities at that stage were very much limited by my capacity. So, you know, I, I, I was literally ground zero after the divorce. Uh, I, I lost pretty much everything. Yeah. So uh, wow. early early on, I spent a couple of years actually day trading the stock market to actually uh, accumulate enough funds to put into a, a deposit for our first property. And our first property was a very humble, meagre little three-bedroom property uh, that we actually found off market so uh, we identified old dinga beach as an area that we, we thought had awesome growth uh, and we knew that there was some major infrastructure that was there was a committed expressway that was going to open up that section because uh, it was about an hour and a half south of adelaide in those days it's now only yeah. a 45 minute drive so the expressway has completely opened up that stretch uh, so we hunted around and we basically walked the walked the suburbs and found this place that looked like it'd been quiet for some time. So my good wife Sonia and I, uh, she 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 will track anything down. Uh, she managed to uh, go down rabbit holes and found the owner in Vietnam. He was actually in Vietnam, and we did a deal with him. And we picked up this three bedroom uh, property on about nine hundred square meters, corner block, uh, for the princely sum of eighty four thousand dollars. Would you believe? <laughs> and uh, still got. Still got the property, and the most recent valuation was at six fifty. So uh, it, it's it's had fantastic growth, but it's gone from one of those little seaside uh, retirement villages. And at the time we bought the property, uh, they had the highest number of unemployed in the state in in that area. But the, again, the ar ar architectural skills here is all about visualizing what's an area going to look like in ten or fifteen years' time, not what does it look like now. And that's one of the mistakes that too many people make. They come with a prejudice based on what does this area look like. But but if you know what's committed and what's changing, what's coming, and you back yourself and have the belief in that, then, uh, I mean, that area is now transformed. Uh, it's it's a now bustling uh, southern suburb. Uh, it's, you know, it had a corner store, basically. You know, when we got involved, it's now got McDonald's and major shopping centres yeah. and the, the whole box and dice. So, Are those type uh, of opportunities still out there? Can we can we be doing those things right now? And well, yeah. Here's the interesting thing. I think, Joe. I think uh, I think COVID is the best thing that's happened to the country. Uh, and I'll probably be shot down for saying that. <laughs> but uh, in, in relation to mixing it up as far as property goes, it's completely turned on its head. The old model of having to own a property as close as you can to CBD, because yeah. what what COVID has done is thrown petrol on the fire as far as uh, this exodus to lifestyle. And uh, as long as an area has really good technology support so that you can uh, work offline and work at home, then uh, I think there's never been a greater opportunity to find opportunities in regional areas. That, And I'm not talking two horse towns, but I'm talking regional cities that have enough critical mass and a diversity of employment and therefore strong and growing incomes to be able to find really good opportunities at a, a much lower price point that are giving good growth potential, but also uh, very strong yields. So you've, you've got that very rare opportunity, I think, in the current marketplace to find uh, good potential capital growth properties, but that can all, also be structured to be positive cash flow, which is, which is quite unusual. Yeah. And do you have like a framework for assessing like where you would say, no, no, this place has too few employment you know there's only there's only sorry not employment uh, population or like do you throw it do you have like those type of filters that you throw over the top of it yeah and i, I will say that I, I i count myself more as a a property orchestra leader rather than a than a deliverer 
So, uh, you know, the, the way we position ourselves, Joe, in relation to the people we help is that uh, we sit on their side of the table and just become an extra set of experienced ears, eyes, arms and legs to assess opportunities on their merits. So we will normally engage a, a buyer's agent to do, do the nitty gritty research. But what we, what we go to them with is that the, the key thing, and, and I'm sure we'll go into this in a bit more detail shortly, the thing we need to do with our clients is get very clear on their strategy. And the, the strategy is in three components. It's lifestyle strategy, because that's ultimately what we're trying to do. We're trying to uh, use the properties to uh, provide the income that's going to sustain whatever lifestyle you want to live. And then the finance strategy needs to come in underneath that because uh, we need to know what your capacity is. So there's no point uh, having these massive dreams if you've got no ability to make it happen. So we need to, to build that on paper first. And then those two then inform what the property strategy is. So what we normally do is we'll establish what the affordable spend is for a particular investor. And I emphasise affordable here. I'm not saying... It's not at how much they can spend, but it's how much is that property going to cost you in week one, year one, two, three, five, ten and beyond so that you know that the sustainability is going to be there and that the property is not going to have a massive hamstring on salary savings and lifestyle. So it becomes a, a sustainable exercise. But once we've established that spend, we normally take what we call a, a top-down scarcity approach. So we start with spend. And then the idea is to find the highest growth three or four bedroom home. And again, I'm jumping around here a bit, but we normal yeah. focus if you're in the growth phase of what you're doing is to find uh, homes in scarce locations. So, and I'm talking homes specifically because yeah. it's got a land component. If we're in the sweet spot of demand for housing in, in Australia, it's a three or four bedroom home on a block of dirt. Uh, so during that capital growth phase, that will, that's what we're focusing on. So we'll establish the spend first and then find the highest growth three or four bedroom home around the country at that price point and then go from state to suburb to street to, to property. So it's a very much top-down approach. And as, as we all know, 80% of the growth generally comes from the location, not from the property itself. So that's a, it's a little bit different from what I see a lot of people doing, and that, that is they chase the hot spots and then try and buy whatever they can in that location. I think that's a flawed, flawed strategy because if you end up buying a one bedroom unit in an area that that's got growth, so that one bedroom unit's not likely to perform anywhere near uh, the 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 level of a three or four bedroom home in the same location. So it's yeah, establish yeah. The, the type and then find the growth location that's going to facilitate that. Well, you see that a lot. You see people like, oh, well, I, this is a suburb. It's going to grow incredibly well. Um, I'm going to buy the thing that I can afford in that area, which happens to be the asset type that is not driving the growth value that people don't actually want to live in and it doesn't push forward the, the price and value. And then you're just stuck with this dud asset that might give you $50 extra cash flow. But that's not going to let you. <laughs> it's not going to let you go. Um, but on strategy, because that's why I really, really wanted to get you on here, is because you're um, you're known for um, a, a, something called the freedom formula. So I'd love I'd love for you to give us a bit of a breakdown. But why um, why why do you think that people just don't do the strategy piece? It must. You, what? Why? Why are we so bad at it? I think, uh, and I'd like your thoughts on this, Steve, because we, we both come from design industries. Uh, people just aren't that creative and they're, they're not that good at visualising. It's not an easy task. It's, it's not something that comes naturally for people to do that. So what tends to happen in that regard is they go for the obvious, and that is they'll, let's just focus on the property. It's there, it's tangible, it's bricks and mortar, I can touch it and I can feel it, I can drive past it, mm. versus the hard work of really doing some, you know, it's between the ears here and visualising exactly how do you want to live, what's your perfect day, your perfect week, your perfect year look like. Uh, once you've established what your lifestyle looks like, what does that lifestyle cost? And once we know what that lifestyle costs, it's very easy to determine the size of the asset base or the nest egg that, that's going to generate that. And then you work back from there to look at, okay, what style and location of property is going to best move me towards that end destination so that that future forecasting and visualization for a lot of people is a struggle joe 
Uh, so uh, if yeah. it doesn't come naturally, most people just don't do it. And I'd, 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 you'd probably have this too, Steve, as a buyer's agent. Uh, the first question we ask people when they come to talk to us about property is, well, tell us about your ideal lifestyle. Yep. And nine times out of ten, I get crickets. Or I get, uh, oh, gee, Bushy, I've never actually thought about that before. The, the one I get is they always want to match their salary. And I go, oh, why? What are you going to do after you match your salary? And then, that, like you said, then you hear crickets. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think that's that's the issue. The the With property, the attraction is all about the property. And there's way too many people who focus just on the property. And then when they buy it and they try and work out what are we going to do with it now, rather than turn it on its head. And the property should actually be the last thing you focus on. We need to get everything else in a row first before the property and the property actually falls out the bottom end so uh, and I'd, I'd, I'd love to talk you through the the essential framework for the freedom formula and the thought processes that go into that so people can sort of understand they can put themselves in that position and then work work themselves through because i know by doing so they're going to get a much better outcome and i think that the really important thing about having a really compelling and vivid uh vision of what your ideal lifestyle is, is yeah. for two key reasons. One, it becomes a magnet in terms of uh, you, you're much more likely to stay the course. Because I, the, one of my other beliefs, and you know, point, you yeah. know, we've all got different beliefs, and there's no one size fits all with property. That's what I love about property. There is no one silver bullet or a, a magic formula that that suits everyone. There's principles, there's processes, and there's key people you need to involve, and then the property falls out of the, the bottom end so uh, in that context it's it's really important i think to make sure that uh, if you do spend some time and it can be a really in, enjoyable process i mean you you can paint it you can create a vision board you can write a poem you can write a letter to yourself uh, you can record it on your iphone it, you make it a really fun project and 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 have some fun with it but as soon as yeah. you do that it's the the old you know what we think about is what we bring about routine once you start focusing on it subliminally it starts to you you don't even know you're doing it half the time you start attracting yourself to it and uh, we all know that property is not an easy journey there's a lot of speed bumps and a lot of issues that occur on property now yes. so if your if your reason for doing it is not compelling enough that's that's why over 50 percent of first-time investors sell the property within the first five years lose money and never come back it's because they don't have a really clear vision on why they're doing it and how this property is contributing to the, the end game. But it also yeah. acts as a, once you've got a really compelling vision, it also acts as a compass because it means that every decision I'm now making day to day is based on, is it taking me closer to that or is it taking me further away? So it, yeah. it, it really starts to crystallise that. And it also gives you a measuring stick. It means that as we then... Uh, go down the journey and we check in every 18 months to two years to see how the portfolio is performing is it on track is the property yeah, doing well, what it needs to be doing is the finance the, structure the time where do we need to be tweaking that have my lifestyle goals changed but at least we've got something to actually boil it against and then uh, rather than what i see a lot of people do is they're only as good as the next person they talk to or the next best shiny thing that comes along and they, they sort of dart around like frenzied hares and then, then wonder why they don't end up getting the fruit at the other end. Yeah. And and you, you you see that you see that all the time. People just quickly moving on, like, oh, where's the next cash flow hotspot? Where's the next growth hotspot? How can I get get this next thing going and going and going? Yeah, I think that's um, why but, a lot of people don't do the plans as well, Joe and Bushy, because they'll effectively there's too many assumptions. They don't know where interest rates are going to be, they don't know the exact growth they're going to be, they don't know but like anything like that. But if you've got the framework, like you said, Bushy, if you get two years down the track and you're not at that goal, it doesn't matter. You've still on, you're still in the right direction. So the main thing, instead of it being a 10-year plan, it just becomes a 13-year plan. Or if you do better than expected, like the last couple of years of a lot of properties, it'll be an eight-year plan. But the framework's there. Yep, mm. spot on. Absolutely spot on. Yeah, and one of my questions was going to be around like, is it just a, a solid static? You get your one pager, you get your you get your plan created, but it sounds like it's more adjustment as it goes. So every time it's a GPS, it yeah, it's, it's, a, it's not a roadmap; it's a GPS. So yeah. it's uh, get clear on the end destination, and even that end destination can change because our, our lifestyle goals and needs change. We have partners, we have kids. We that that will change along the journey, but as as long as we're revisiting it on a regular basis 
and adjusting it as necessary, at least we've got something that's guiding our direction and keep us ex excited about what we're trying to achieve with property. So, um, yeah. so yeah, that's that's the key piece. Perfect. Okay. Well, I think you've, the good thing about this medium, this is what I love about this Facebook live thing is that we, we've got, you've got some spread, you've got some slides to show us that run through a little bit of your story and also a bit about um, the freedom formula. So for those that don't know, let's, uh, let's jump in for anyone. Um, let me just add this. Um, guys, pop your questions in the comment box um, when you get them, pop them in there and um, we'll answer them at the end because we're about to get some Solid knowledge bombs dropped on us. Bushy, give, give us a bit of a rundown. Passive aggressive, are we? Jesus. Well, yeah, I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm a, a shocker for really bad acronyms and, and bad expression. I've got a really bad sense of humor, guys, so, so forgive me for it. But uh, <laughs> when, I, um, when I was recovering from the, the divorce back in the uh, mid-90s, uh, I um, went along to a Robert Kiyosaki conference in Adelaide a mate of mine dragged me along to the rich dad poor dad exercise and uh, it, it was a real penny drop moment I know I mean a lot of people talk about how uh, inspirational uh, that rich dad poor dad was it yeah. was a real I, I, I call it my Kiyosaki moment actually because uh, there was an absolute penny drop in that yeah. he I remember him saying that the moment you make passive income a part of your life your life will change and mm -hmm. I started to see everything differently from that point from that point onwards because because i'd been working seven days a week 14 hours a day as an architect for for years there was no way i was going to do that again I was absolutely determined to because uh, my time is my most precious asset so everything is about getting my time back that, that's the drive it's not about the money it's about the time so uh, from that point on with those lens that uh, and I, I refer to it as becoming passive aggressive everything that we put our my good wife Sonia and I put our time and our energy and money into from that point on had to have growth it had to produce or have the potential for a, a passive income stream and it had to be saleable and scalable so that applied to our property portfolio it applies to the business interests that we've built around it uh, so we had our first entourage on the business side in that area. So we, we came in cold and started a property management business because we weren't happy with the quality of the property managers that were looking after our properties at the time. So yeah. we started a property management business. And a property management business is basically a passive income business. So if you build up enough rentals, you get a regular income stream and it's a saleable asset, which we, did. we sold the property management business about five years ago. I then yeah, realized... With... with, with um... With property management, like I imagine this is very heavy, intense time wise. Like you've got a rent roll of 200, 300, 400, 500 people. You've got to manage all of that. Like, um, we had a team. A bit of a <laughs> we had a team, mate. We didn't do it ourselves. So, yeah. Uh, and and that, that's we, we, our, our goal and everything is to make us replaceable. The, the, gone are the days where ego gets in the road. Uh, you know, it's the egos is your. Uh, Worst friend when it comes to this, because if you think you're indispensable, you will be. Uh, yeah. Our view is to uh, how can we replace ourselves, which is exactly what we did in, in that sphere. And yes, it's a very grunty business, Joe. There's absolutely no question about it. But with yeah. the lessons we learned that I'm, my good wife, Sonia, pretty much drove that business. Uh, and it was very time consuming. And I'll talk in a minute around the approach that we took. Because one of the approaches that I'd like to share tonight is what I call the money Madison. And I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute in, in the relation to how can you create income but also build wealth at the same time. And it's it's always a conundrum because if your career is soaking up, you know, 50 or 60 hours a week, uh, you don't have a lot of energy left or time left to put into building an uh, investment portfolio. So uh, I've got some suggestions on on how we can overcome that conundrum. But sort of moving through it, uh, How did you go from the transition between being an architect into a completely different industry? Uh, yeah, I've been very lucky, I guess, uh, Steve, in that um, change has never really scared me too much. I, I was treated, treated like a leper by the architectural fraternity. Uh, they, they all thought I was a traitor and, and uh, you know, I, I catch, uh, architects have got the worst um, divorce rate of any profession by the way. So when I catch up with the guys, it's like a time warp. They're all bald, uh, uh, depressed, divorced, uh, still working their, their buns off uh, not much. Uh, so I, I feel quite relieved at doing it. But I've, I've never been scared to have a crack at something. 
And my, my view is that, uh, again, it just comes back to keeping the end goal in mind. I just keep, uh, Sonia and I, we just ask questions and we keep asking questions and we're an absolute pest asking questions until we know the answer, until we don't have to ask the questions. So we, we I mean, I, the, the second business we started, we started a finance broking business. And I just, I spoke to every broker in Adelaide before I uh, decided to get on board with someone. And we, we end up becoming business partners before we then ran our own race. But I said to him, I'm going, I'm going to be the most annoying bastard you've ever met because I'm going to pester you with questions until I know enough that I don't have, don't have to ask you anymore. So uh, a bit of a lifetime learner. I, I love learning. It's just, you know, I, I'll stop learning when they know me in a box. Uh, that keeps, keeps me live. So there was no real fears about that. And I was so, the again, the reason for doing it was so compelling. But passive aggressive, the property yeah. management is going to do it. The, the finance broking, very much the same. You build up a, a, a trail book over time, which is a saleable asset. So that's giving you a, an ongoing income stream. And the properties were exactly the same. So it was all about lifestyle and it was all about time. The only reason we're building the businesses and building the in, a property portfolio is to get our time back. That's as, it's as absolutely as simple as that. So, so like, I think that the, that for you, it sounds like the, um, the, the AD, um, time period was like a, a period of reflection and, um, like time to figure these things out. I, I don't know, this might be, but how can people get on board with the mindset, get on board of this type of stuff without having to, you know, go through the experience of having to go through that? Um, what are some yeah. of the things that, you know, everyday people can just, kind of look at it a bit more it take a weekend out uh, every every year well we we haven't gone to bali for a little while now but every year we go to bali and we take four days out and we just we just literally do a uh, brainstorming session we check in we check in on how we how we're tracking and we and we we have some fun uh, i'll i'll uh, my um uh, i write down my perfect day uh, sonia uh, writes a letter to her mother uh, there's a whole different bunch of ways of doing this you, you can paint it you can draw it uh the, the the simple mass is actually taking the time out and and just having a conversation so uh when we first did it which was really rudimentary uh when we sonia and i first got together we went to a, a little restaurant in in a tiny little uh town in the adelaide hills called clarendon we stumbled ac across this place and we sat down and basically just just sketched and wrote it down this is what we want to do this is and then we, and then the guy who owned the restaurant uh just happened to be an accountant he was sort of sticking his head over looking at what we're doing and he actually sat down with us and he helped us monetize what that lifestyle was so uh, that was our our first crack at it and uh it's just people don't take the time joe so yeah. uh, i mean in in my book the freedom formula and this is a you know a, a shameless plug <laughs> but uh, I've got a chapter there on how to help you actually put some shape around what your vision for your life actually is and the process that we went through and some other suggestions on what you can do to do that because um, uh, it doesn't take long. It's just that we don't make the time for it or, or very few people do anyway. Yeah. Okay. You, you have what, to write it down at? as well. You can't, you can't, I was going to say you have to write it down. You can't just think of it because then people just say, oh, I don't want to work. That's my goal. That, that's not a goal. That's You can quit tomorrow. Sell your house if you've got to spare 500000 You can live the next 10 years pretty comfortably. So you have to write it down, I'd say. Ab yeah. Absolutely. You, you've got to document it. There's, in, in, absolutely spot on, Steve. And then revisit it on a regular basis. There's no question about that. So I, I guess and I, what I want to do is share some of the lessons that because I at, at that time when we I, I had that sort of ground zero moment, uh, I was so determined not to end up in the same position that I read absolutely everything I could get my hands on. I'm a, I'm a rabid reader at the best of times anyway, but I basically uh, read everything. That, that existed around the whole investment space, around the property space. And the resounding thing that kept coming through was that only about 5% of investors are successful. And that's not just in property, that's across the board. But what separates the best from the rest is that uh, the 5% tend to focus on the principles, the process and the people. And property is the last thing versus the others who focus purely on the property and then try and work out what happens after that. So th that was a, a real key component of it. Um, the other, and, and again, there's nothing rocket science in this, but the if because if, I'm a man of very simple 
simple you language. Love a, you love an acronym. <laughs> oh, I love acronyms. Oh, mate, I'm the acronym king. No, mate, no doubt about that because it's that, it's the only way I remember stuff, guys. It solidifies uh, it, right? It yeah, it does. I, I I refer to you know success in uh, sustainable success for me lies at the intersection of three things: self, health, and wealth. So self is what's between your ears, what you think, what your mindset is, what your expectations are, what your self-belief is and what your belief is in other things. Health is about the happy habits and the rewarding rituals that you develop both in, in terms of your diet, in terms of exercise. But the, the daily habits are the things that build up the persistence, the patience and the discipline that then allow you to enjoy success in wealth. Now, wealth can be in business, in career, in property, in shares, in crypto, you, you name it, whatever it is, whatever success means to you, but it is a three-legged chair. And if you just focus on wealth and you haven't got your headset right in terms of yourself and you haven't got your health right, then you, you won't sustain it. And I saw my old man do that. He worked himself into an early grave because he was just focused on the wealth and he killed himself in the process. But in the property sense, the if, if we break that down, the three key things I think, uh, and I'm talking about what's worked for us and the other people that we continue to help. If I wanted to sum it up, it's TLC. So it's time. So, you know, the, the study that I did repeatedly demonstrated to me, if we look back through history and what's happened with property cycles over time, uh, and I'm a very conservative investor, the, the uh, S curve of growth that happens in a particular location generally takes somewhere between 8 to 15 years. So if you go in assuming it's going to take 15 years and you embrace time as your friend, not your enemy, because most people treat time as an enemy. They're in a gut-busting hurry to make things happen yesterday. Yeah. And then when it doesn't, they shipwreck or self-sabotage themselves. So if yeah, we... Yeah, you must... Steve, um, I'm kind of interested in what you see in, in the you know your business you you deal with clients all the time and you as well bushy but um like do you see this happen a lot where clients are like okay great i need a x amount of return in in a year two years like where how am i going to get this where's this money coming from how's it going to happen i want it done asap yeah no that's like bushy said it's client dependent as well it's going to depend on over what time frame you're working but that's also why i moved into commercial because commercial i can not guarantee their cash flow for that period but I can say, yeah. well, you've got a tenant, you're receiving this income. And then if any capital growth is a bonus, but you lose leveraging with commercial. And that's why Bushy saying, if you're starting out, you need to maximize leveraging. And that's number point two he's got on his slide. Leveraging is why we invest in property. If we're using cash, well, there's a lot, lot more other options. 100%. Spot on, Steve. And in leverage in two formats. It's leverage of other people's money, which is the banks, but also leverage of other people's expertise. Uh, one thing I learned, the, the, one of the big mistakes I made early on is I didn't trust anyone. I tried to reinvent the wheel and I was making mistakes I didn't even know I was making because I just didn't know what I didn't know. But what, one of the key things I say to people is the on, your only role is to be the manager of your team. You own the team, you just manage your managers. If you're trying to do it yourself, you're creating a second job trying to do this, you, you're, you're going to uh, compromise and you, you won't end up with... Uh, great results as a consequence of that. So leverage is the third part. And the obvious one that we all talk about is that is the power of compounding. Because uh, if we allow it to do its work over time, now we've all seen the beautiful exponential curves and I'll, 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 I'll show this to you now. Uh, we've all, all seen the beautiful exponential curves that we see in, in learning anything, in business we see it with growth of, of companies over time, whether it be property or shares, it normally takes, if you look at all the successful investors, the Warren Buffetts, the, in, in, if we look at Pete Wargen in uh, Australia, if we look at his journey, uh, it's always 15 to 20 years before they really hit their straps. So if we embrace that and we say, right, okay, this is going to be a 15 or 20 year journey, let's accept that and then enjoy it and let, and yeah. let time do its heavy lifting all we need to do is make sure that we've structured the investment in such a way that it is uh, affordable and the cash flow is sustainable over that period. So the structuring of that becomes really key to make sure you're doing it. So very heavily negative geared properties aren't the go because, uh, one, it's if you're living on baked beans and dog food while you're trying to put a portfolio together, you're not going to sustain it for very long. Uh, so it, it's really important to focus on growth but make it affordable growth through clever structuring to make sure that it's not not 
uh, hamstringing your lifestyle while the property is doing its doing its work. So that's a, a key component of it. Um, the so the, the question we need to ask ourselves is is how are we going to last that distance? How are we going to cross that chasm? And that that's where the affordability piece becomes very strong because uh, if we don't do that, that's where we start to shipwreck ourselves. And one so of the when method- you say afford- affordability, what do you mean? Yeah, so what's a property costing you actually costing you per week to hang on to? So I'll, I'll go through this in a bit more detail in a minute, but we spend a lot of time using some quite sophisticated software uh, to tell us exactly how much a, a property is costing uh, on a weekly basis when every conceivable cost involved in uh, securing and holding the property is put in play. And I just I, I see very few pe- people spend any energy on that either. They'll look at, here's the loan, here's the rent, here's the gap. Oh, great, I can afford it. Well, that's only half the story. We haven't looked at, at all of the ongoing costs. We haven't looked at any depreciation and tax benefits that need to be weaved into the equation to actually look at what the true bottom line uh, cost of that property is. And it's really important to understand what is affordable to an individual because some some are, are happy to have a you know that they can they can handle a couple of hundred bucks a week. Others, if it's costing them a cent, it's not going to work. So this is where getting really clear on what a particular investor can afford in terms of that ongoing uh, holding cost is going to be crucial to lasting that that fifteen plus years. And one of the methods that, that Sonia and I have used to do it, I, I spoke earlier in our discussion around this challenge between work and wealth and between yeah. investment and uh, income. Because if, if we're tied up in a profession or a job or a career that's that's soaking up anywhere between 40 and quite often 50 or 60 hours for most people in this day and age, very difficult to find the time to actually uh, put the energy that you need to to build, build the wealth. So what Sonia and I did almost by mistake initially, but then it became a bit, a bit of a pattern for us is that, uh, and uh, again, I use some really bad analogies, guys, but uh, <laughs> do you know the, uh, you know, the bike race you would have seen at the Olympics is called the Madison where you've got two riders. One is racing around the inside of the track. The other one's up on the, up on the curve. And then he comes back in, he gets hurled into the race. And then the other one takes a, takes a break. And then they do this interchange. They do this right. constant interchange as they're going around the track. Well, that's exactly what Sonia and I end up doing to actually build our portfolio. So if, if you, I mean, there's a lot of information on that slide there, but the way we started, uh, when we when we got stuck into it, um, the uh, Sonia was running a recruitment business. Uh, I I jumped out of employment altogether, and I started building. I, I actually day traded for a couple of years to build up the uh, deposits to get into property. And then we just decided to start the property management business. So Sonia switched out of recruitment into driving the property management, the property management exercise, and I, I started consulting. We were starting to add properties at that time. And then uh, we waited until the property management business had got to a critical mass where it could sustain our lifestyle. And then I started the mortgage broking business. All the time we're adding properties through this journey. And then we sold the property management business and then Sonia and I now uh, both work in the business together. So what we're able to do with that over time by, by passing the baton and by having one, one driving the income while the other was building the wealth meant that we uh, were able to achieve a lot more than if we were just trying to do it part time. So uh, for those that are listening that are partners, think seriously about it. I mean, uh, did we did we live fairly leanly? Yeah, we did because we we're basically living on one income at that stage. Uh, but it, you adjust to it pretty easily. We we don't feel yeah. like we we've done it tough, but it really gave gave us an an alternating alternating basis the ability to build the knowledge and have the time to put our energy into building the the wealth side at the same time. So uh, we Absolutely. call it the money medicine. It's the the worker and the wealth builder. But it's, it's something that I think if, uh, you know, a lot of investors embrace that as an idea, as a couple, and, and it's not about having one always working the income and the other building the wealth. It can be, it can be, but uh, both Sonia and I uh, love to be busy. Uh, so uh, Sonia wouldn't have been happy uh, sitting at home building the wealth while I worked and vice versa. We, we, we use that opportunity to actually take time out 
And uh, while we were doing that, they gave us the opportunity to create the portfolio that we now have. So, so uh, that was an important component and, and something that I think has worked extremely well for us. You mentioned why property before. Uh, I mean, the, this is all pretty obvious, but uh, the key one, which Steve has already mentioned, it's, it's superior leverage. leverage. You know, if, I, if I look at putting money into equities versus property, for example, because of the, the effectively safe leverage you can get by using the bank's money, I can get three and a half time, times the asset size out of property as I can out of equities because of the fact that the banks are going to let me borrow 90 95% of it. So and and banks don't into aren't into losing money. So if they think it's safe enough to borrow that money, it's a pretty good indicator that they see it as a safe asset to do that as well. Property is so also a very your, real. Wait, sorry, John. The question I've got is is around um like your share portfolio. Were you buying? Pro, you were buying shares and day trading shares to build up a deposit to then go back into property space. But that was because you didn't have a, enough cash to be able to do that. Um, I had nothing. Have you been, <laughs> Just I had nothing. I, I literally, I, I started trading with a thousand bucks. As soon as I could put a thousand bucks away, that that was enough for me to get started. And and believe wow. you me, I made some mistakes in the day trading side of things as well. Wow, that's a that's a real roller coaster that ride. Uh, <laughs> and 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 for some people, it's awesome. For me, it didn't suit sitting sitting six hours in front of a screen. Uh, I, I I like I needed social interaction. Uh, it wasn't the right fit for me. And yeah. I had some, you know, I, the toughest part about day trading was that uh, it's it can be extremely volatile. I, I was trading CFDs, which are a heavily leveraged wow. instrument anyway. And uh, you can have some sensational wins, but you can have some catastrophic losses in that. And I had some. I had there's I had a couple of trades that lost thirty grand. So, so were you uh, buying? Um were you buying shares and investing in shares while you were purchasing property as well? Like, was that a balance of both or did you just go heavy into property once you got that deposit and then started to, as your portfolio started to accrue, you started to get more cash flow diversified assets? Um, what, Spot on. Look? Spot on. So initially it was all shares because that, that, that got me into the space, yes. uh, into the property space. Then it was all about property during the growth phase. And I'll, I'll talk about the cash flow, to, the capital growth of cash flow curve in a minute because it'll make sense. Uh, yeah. In that context, uh, but that that was the real uh, key there. And then, as you as you say, as we built the asset portfolio that we've now diversified, and we're, we're at the stage where I've, we're shifted to the the cash flow component of our portfolio. So we're actually divesting mm. some of the growth assets and moving them into cash flow. And yeah. uh, so you could, know, could, the, you have, could you have achieved what you've achieved so far without the leverage that property that property gives you? Like if you were just focusing sh uh, purely on shares, no. No, yeah. not, not not a scratch. So one of the key components that I, I think, uh, again, a lot of investors don't uh, get clear in their head is how much time do I physically have to, to manage this investment asset? Mm -hmm. And if it's not long, don't, don't go into equities. Because, in my, and again, this is my belief, uh, yeah. equities uh, require a lot more of your time to monitor them. I mean, yeah. when I, day trading is a little bit different. When I was day trading, it was six hours a day. You know, it was yeah. a couple of hours before the open of the market and uh, a couple of hours before and after the close. Uh, so it's a very grunty time commitment. What was good about property is that if you've set it up well enough and you've got a good team around you, you, you really don't need to be spending more than a, an hour or two a month and then yeah. three or four hours around tax time. Uh, so you, given time, as I keep saying this, time is the most important asset to me, uh, then I like to invest in things that don't require me to put in excessive amounts of time to monitor and manage. So, uh, I find, so I find that my, a my, my share friends will check their share prices every day. I'm like, oh, are you looking at selling? No, that is, that is checking it for the sake of checking it. <laughs> well, and, and it can lead to some dumb decisions uh, because the, the more you play with something, you're more likely to stuff it up. So uh, <laughs> I, I like to inoculate myself from myself. You know, the, the biggest yeah. impediment to my investment is yours truly. It's the, it's the right. man in the mirror because uh, as soon as you start to try and make the market or you get involved and start to try and make things happen once you're, you're into a, an investment, that, that's where you, you trip yourself up. Yeah. So, uh, and, and, and I'm I'm exactly the same. Like I, 
I just couldn't stomach the the highs and lows. So I deleted all the apps. So I'm like, oh, I'm buying this for a long-term purchase. I'm just going to, I'm not going to check it. And then obviously you'd find the online platform and you'd <laughs> end up on there. You'd keep looking and, and it's just, it's just so stressful watching it go up and down, up and down. But if you want good share advice, just do the exact opposite of what I do. And um, you'll be very <laughs> successful, uh, very <laughs> successful. <laughs> yeah, I love it. Love it. Terrible. Well, you, you, um, sorry, you had Pete. Kind of, yeah, go ahead. You had Pete Wardgen on the on the show here a while back, and uh, Pete Wardgen and his offside of Steve Moriarty, uh, the next level wealth. Uh, they, if you're looking at equities and how to do it effectively, I'll be chatting to those guys. They they really do it extremely well extremely well but what why property what why was i attracted to property leverage yes it's a real tangible need this is obvious stuff but what i love about property as well is it's a very emotionally driven asset so you know if we're going into the right areas and uh you know predominantly an area is is going to be driven by owner occupiers all we need to do in, as investors is slipstream on the emotion we're not making emotional decisions, but everyone else is. So we just want to be slipstreaming on areas where everyone wants to be. They want to get their kids into the school catchment areas. It's got all the lifestyle amenities. All we're doing is slipstreaming in behind that emotion. And uh, property is an imperfect market. That's what I love about property. Every property in every street and every area is different from every other one. So there's yeah. no ability really to do a true apples for apples comparison, which means you have a much bigger opportunity to create value and distinguish value over over equity where everyone's op operating off the same information instantly. So yeah, it creates that's, a, that's a, a fantastic point. That's a fantastic it, point. It creates right. a much much bigger opportunity base, I think. So so that they're the keys there. Um, beyond and that, there's not much there's not much value that I can add to Apple. I can't uh, I can't buy an iPhone to really hedge <laughs> make a massive difference. But if I spend you know a couple of grand on a renovation, then maybe I can make a difference to my direct asset. Exactly right. You, you can definitely influence the value of that asset, and you can create equity in property that you just can't do in shares. There's, there's no doubt about it. So uh, we, we, we spoke briefly before about, well, and I'll, I might just go back to this because I, 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 this, is, this is how simple uh, my investment philosophy is. I call it wealth by stealth, and it's, it's, there's no rocket science with any of this, but it's really simple. It's used as little of my own money to acquire as big an asset base as possible as quickly as, as possible and make it as affordable as possible and then just let time, the tenants, the tax office and capital growth do the work. That's that's as that's as sophisticated as it yep. needs to be, I believe. Yeah, uh, that's what Jeff Jeff and I say: make the most amount of money in the quickest time with the least amount of risk and the least amount of frustration. Um, spot on, spot on. So the, the, again, there's no rocket science with that. I well, I haven't invented this. There's people been doing this for <laughs> for for hundreds of years, uh, but there's just not <laughs> enough people that spend enough time focusing on it. Uh, the, the, the key yeah. thing. I was going to say, do you focus sometimes on having too like not enough money and going into an asset class where you might like? I did that early in my career. I had like I had thirty thousand dollars, so I went and bought a thirty thousand dollar apartment in Cairns. So I, I think oh, there's wow. still going to be some level of benchmark that you you step into it though. Yeah, yeah and I same, totally agree. Exact, exact same story with me, right? I, I bought a two hundred eighty thousand dollar property in an area that that didn't appreciate two hundred eighty thousand dollar properties and. It's so true just to get into something, but maybe you should have say, I should have saved an extra 50, you know, $20,000. And actually I would have had a massive increase by now, but I chose the poor asset Got kind of back to what we were saying before. Yeah. Which, which is pretty normal. I think we've, we've all done that at various times. It's, it's a, it's a, a natural, natural thing to occur. But one thing that I, that I also had, well, and, and again, this is talking about the bleeding obvious, but uh, everyone talks about the property market. The property market doesn't exist. It exists for the media because it gives them something to talk about. But uh, it's not like the share market where, where we are all dealing with the same information and we are comparing apples with apples. Uh, and what that means is every location, and even down at the precinct level, is operating its, its growth cycle out of sync generally with, with other locations. And, and that that S curve cycle, which generally only sees a three or four year growth spurt, and then it'll go, it'll plateau or even come back slightly for five to eight years before it then goes through its next growth phase. Yeah. That's the where, thing that, that people have this, this expectation of linear growth. Well, it, it, 
it very rarely exists. And, yeah. and, you know, we're seeing it right now. We're going through a once in a 30-year growth spurt that's affecting most properties across the country. That won't be sustainable. We'll see A-grade properties continue to go very well, but B and C-grade stuff will, will really start to suffer. But yeah. again, it's about this expectation. If we're going in knowing that it's a 15-year S-curve and uh, we're in it for at least 15 years, then we're going to go through its duration. So it, it lessens the need to have to time the market. If you can time the market, it's a great bonus because you can turbocharge the equity early in the piece, which you can then use that equity to fold into other properties. But it's not mm. mandatory if, if you're confident around the growth drivers that are attached to that particular location. Where, but, where but do you think we are in the current market um, in terms of this scale here that we're looking at here? Where do you think we're at? Yeah, well, I, I still think we've got some growth to go, but, but it's going to taper. So we're, we're already seeing it start to taper. And uh, I think we've got a, the, the major impact that, that affects property values are interest rates. If you look historically at the major drivers of, of property value, it's the access to credit. So as soon as they start tightening credit, and we, we're seeing a little bit of a dabble with that with macro prudential uh, measures by APRA that have crept in, which started this week in relation to the major banks lifting their servicing rate. That'll slightly dampen uh, borrowing capacity, which will have a, a little bit of an effect on demand. But it, yeah. it won't be until they start playing with interest rates themselves that'll have a real meaningful impact. And mm. that's a if you, if you look at what the uh, RBA governor said this week, he's still saying that until wages growth stroke inflation is in the target range, we won't be touching with we won't be touching interest rates. Now banks are playing with fixed rates as they've always played with fixed rates because fixed fixed rates are at the discretion of the bank. They can raise them and, and drop them at their own discretion. They generally use them as bait and switch techniques to sucker people into uh, getting across to the bank and then using them as golden hand handcuffs to make it difficult for them to, to move on. But I still think we've got uh, at least a, a good couple of years of, of growth ahead of us. Not, not at the same rate. It's, it's been yeah. meteoric rate, but it's been more like a spring that's been compressed during COVID that th that's then been let go. And it'll it'll, right. it'll start to taper back, but uh, and, and then it'll depend on the quality of the property beyond that. At the moment, pre, you know, the rising tide is floating all ships, but that that's very rare. It's very rare we see. You know, I think there's according to core logic figures, of ninety seven percent of region across the country have all all experienced on average roughly twenty percent growth over the last twelve months. Yeah, you know, that's that's and when you look at the the last. 25 years, the average capital growth across the country has been about 6.8%, then that, that is uh, meteoric growth in that context, clearly unsustainable, uh, but we've still got some some upside yet over the next couple of years, I believe, before we do start to see particularly B and C grade properties start to plateau. Well, because that's one of the concerns that I'm kind of starting to hear out there, that the banks, the, the APRA's put this little tiny little thing on here that's scaring a lot of people. And then um, just read, I think, was it, oh, I can't, I don't know if it was NAB or uh, we won't name whatever bank it was, um, in slightly playing around with those interest rates. But that's not a concern for you at all. That's just a, that's just a little. They're not, they're not playing with variable rates, Joe. Once they start playing with, and in fact, we've actually seen a couple of the second tier lenders drop their variable rates uh, below 2% this week. So, uh, you know, when they, they are, playing around with fixed rates. And let's let's be clear, uh, when the poo hit the fan last year with COVID, the banks have used very low fixed rates to attract borrowers to refinance and move across. And, and what's clever about fixed rates is they are literally golden handcuffs because once you've locked into a fixed rate, it gets very expensive. You need to break that fixed period. So they know they've got your business for at least as long as the fixed fixed exercise, which a lot of people fix for at least two and, and three years. But uh, they are very discretionary, Joe, and we're, we're yeah. seeing banks raise those fixed rates. The other thing to, to uh, be aware of with APRA, there's been a lot of talk about APRA sort of getting starting to get stuck into the banks, and we've seen this increase in the servicing rate that took effect as of the first of this month from 25 to 3%. But APRA only influences that can only impact on the the major banks. So you know the top four. Uh, there's forty odd lenders out there. Uh, the second tier lenders uh, aren't 
they still have discretion around their servicing rate. So you, it's not like the whole industry has been affected by it. And yeah. we'll, we'll see some toying around with macroprudential stuff, but it generally doesn't have a great influence. It'll, it'll tamper demand a little bit, no question but it won't have the impact that a, a rise in interest rates will have. And I, I still believe we're at least 2024 before we'd like to see that happen. But this is the whole point with the 15-year mindset as well. You, you shouldn't be that worried about interest rates. We, we weren't in 2010 going, oh, what happens in 2021 if there's a pandemic and interest rates go up from 26 to 3.2%? It's long, long-term mindset always. Totally. Well, I, I don't know about you guys, but I, I lived through the days in the uh, late, uh, 80s where I had properties at 17%. <laughs> now, uh, sort of uh, 2 to 3%, <laughs> come on. Uh, even if even if we did see uh, a couple of rate rises and it jumped up to 3 or a bit over, it's still cheap money, guys. It's, well, and it's only I'm those good. that have really overextended themselves uh, beyond beyond the pale that will suffer. For, for those of us uh, that have a have what I would call good prudent practice, and that's to have war chested funds and rainy day reserves. We shouldn't be we shouldn't be worried. Do do yeah. you have an interest rate that you use, Bushy, when you're doing the fifteen year plans for people? Yeah, I do, mate. So on, on a worst case basis, we normally use seven percent. Okay. And if it works wow. at seven percent, then we're pretty confident that things are going to be okay. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> yeah. Very unlikely to get anywhere near there, I, I believe, in the, the foreseeable future. And I, I think we're stuck with low rates for a, quite a an extensive duration. If we use Japan as an example, Japan went close to zero back in the, the late 80s and they're still there. And uh, we're in a very, economically, we're in a very similar situation to what J Japan was then. I, I think we're in for a low rates environment for quite some foreseeable time. We might get incremental changes in two or three years' time, but it's still not going to be a major lift. So, uh, yeah. so but yeah, so uh, that side of it's important. Now now I want to really get to the, the guts of the... Uh, okay. Yeah, the, I think this is going to be the most um, exciting part of... Uh, well, it's all great. It's all very valuable. It all builds upon each other. <laughs> Everything else was crap. Um, <laughs> this is fantastic. Uh, <laughs> well, I, this is, no. I, I guess, what, what we're seeing here, guys, is the, the well, uh, I always hear I this to... argument. <laughs> Sorry, Joe. Sorry, Bush, but before we jump into, before we jump into this um, sensational breakdown, we've got to run our second ad from our other sponsor. Um, so we've got to jump onto that. It's the, it's the, it's the final one. It's this guy, I don't, you know, he gets, he gets about a little bit. So I'm going to work out how to do that it's this guy it's this one here he, he said oh look guys you're gonna have to run my ad just just run it okay uh, <laughs> he's, he's, he's kicked me under the table here and he said run my ad okay hang on. we got to run this one and then we'll run through this growth how you look at growth and how you look at cash flow because i think this is one of the fundamental things that people are constantly getting wrong chasing um chasing cash flow so let's let's do it where is it the amazing thing with commercial property investing is that in most cases, it's cash flow positive from day one, which means that you can drive those profits towards paying down the debt. There are instances with commercial property investing where you can actually have the property pay itself off over 10 years, which is absolutely crazy. With commercial property, you get massive net yield, so you can expect anywhere between six to 10%. And as we've seen in the current boom, these properties not only provide large cash flow, they do certainly grow wildly in value too. Now with big rewards comes some risk, and this is why you should de-risk your investment as much as possible. And the way you do that is with expert due diligence. And this is why we highly recommend people hire professionals to help you along in your investing journey. Steve Polisi of Polisi Property is one such expert. Being a chartered mechanical and structural engineer in a past life, Steve draws on his analytical and mathematical skills to do that expert due diligence for you. With six years experience in the space, Steve has over 1,200 property transactions under his belt. He's the guy you want in your corner, crunching the numbers and finding the best properties in the best locations, along with ensuring that you avoid the mistakes. Steve has actually even written the book on commercial property investing in Australia. And not only is it a bestseller, I believe it to be the most comprehensive in commercial property investing on the market today.
He's been generous enough to give us a massive discount for our audience of 50%. So use the code OZPROP, click the link below, get a copy today and start learning and getting on your commercial property investing journey. <laughs> Brent, where, where, where do I get onto that guy? What a man. <laughs> what a man. <laughs> what a man. How good is the new how good is the new ad? I, I just love it. it. <laughs> I love when you say I believe it to be the best book. I'm like, that means no one else does. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was like, I can't say the world believes it's so but I believe it. It's the best one on commercial. I've got a bookshelf full of uh property books and um there's a lot of fluff that goes about, um, and there's a lot of um, good. Yeah. Anyway, it's not. Yeah, a I've Steve read it too. Show. It like, is a good read. It is a good read. I've read it. <laughs> it is a good read. So, uh, and and it's it's certainly opened my eyes to things in commercial property that I hadn't thought of. So, uh, it's uh, as I as I shift into the transition into the cash flow stage of my journey, uh, commercial is something I'll be talking to Steve about. Thanks, Bushy. Yeah, well, 100%. Well, that's exactly, I think, what we're going to be talking about here. I'm going to try and make this bigger. So I'm actually going to get rid of our little faces. Yeah, so great. Can, Perfect. Yeah, can... So so this is the crux of the exercise for me because I, you, we always hear, hear this argument about should I be going for capital growth or should I be going for cash flow? For me, uh, it's actually a really simple equation. And if we, if we, again, if we come back to focus on the end game, uh, in terms of building a nest egg that's ultimately going to create the passive income that's going to fund, fund our lifestyle long term, it's, it's really simple. If your net wealth, so the, the size of your nest egg net, and I'm excluding your family home from this because I don't consider your family home to be an asset. Why do I say that? It doesn't give you an income, it costs you money, and uh, you've got to live somewhere. So uh, the, your home is your fortress. So I isolate the family home from your asset pool. And then we look at what's left in terms of super, cash, property, shares, crypto, if you've got it, you name it. And we look at the nest asset wealth of that. And if it's not projected over whatever time frame you decide that you are looking to get to a point where you don't have to work anymore, and I'd, I'm, I'm not going to use the word retire, I'm using the word don't have to work anymore because most of us will continue to do some work in some fashion because we've got an interest in it. But it's really simple. If your nest egg is below the level it needs to generate your passive income stream, you're in growth. So your growth needs to be your key focus. Once your nest egg gets to the size over time that it needs to be, it's about rationalizing the portfolio and converting it to cash flow. Now, there's a couple of really key points with this. Because I think one of the fallacies that's, that's wrongly promoted out there is that you just put your, and, and, and a lot of Australians invest very heavily in residential property, thinking that they're going to live off the rent. Well, that's never going to happen. It's never going to be enough. For me, residential property is a really good growth vehicle, but it's not a good cash flow vehicle. So go for growth and then convert to cash flow at the point where your nest egg has reached the the size it needs to at the time it needs to. So what does that fold down to? If we're in the growth phase, which most Australians are in the growth phase of their investment, because let's face it, if, if, you're, if you're looking to get 100 grand a year at a 5% net return, you need $2 million worth of net assets to, to do it. So most Australians are, are below that. There's a few that's not. But uh, if, if you're below it, then that tends to drive residential property as a, as a strong growth a driver, it's normally three or four bedroom houses. Uh, quite often, it can be new build if it's in in scarce infill blocks because you get some really significant stamp duty and depreciation benefits from doing it, or redevelopment. Uh, so they're they're the, the that's the asset type that's appropriate to that. Once we go into the what I call the liberate stage, which is creating that rationalizing the portfolio and, and converting it to cash flow, then they're very different assets altogether. So that's where the likes of townhouses and uh, apartments can, can come into play because they are, have higher yields. But commercial property in particular is, is you know, streets ahead in that regard. So uh, in that transition phase, moving into commercial, whether it be through your self-managed super, if you've got one or, or otherwise, that, that's certainly going to give you a strong income stream. But it can also be index funds, uh, dividends from blue chip shares, 
a mix of cash. It's a bit of a, a, a balanced portfolio there at that stage. But with the underwriter, again, that what I'm personally looking to invest in doesn't require a lot of my time to manage. So index funds and commercial properties aren't going to take a lot of time for me to look after while it's giving me a really good, strong income stream afterwards. And you might still have a, a couple of your uh, residential properties in there if they're really strong yielding and assuming that there's no debt at that point in time, they might still make up part of the equation, but there are better cash flow vehicles. So uh, just to, to summarise that, it's all about going from growth and converting to cash flow. Not And the mistake I see a lot of uh, investors make is they focus on the cash flow component they're, but they get capped out in terms of their borrowing, which limits how much they can add, and the rent's never enough once you subtract the the debt and all the other costs associated with it to fund any form of lifestyle. So, yeah. does, does that make that's sense? The biggest, that's the biggest thing that I constantly see um, in you know in our group and in other groups as well is that people are like, you know, it starts at house and land packages, and that's where they get this started. They're like, okay, let's check these things out. Um, and then it, and then they're like, okay, then no, that's not the right way to go. I need to start looking at cash flow positive assets that are going to give me this yield. Because if I can have ten, if I can have fifteen properties that give me two hundred dollars a week, then I'm going to be able to retire, and that's going to be the best thing ever. And then you start to come to the reality of, oh, what about serviceability? What about what about um, being able to actually borrow that money to be able to get to that next level? Um, and this makes this is I love, what I love about this is it kind of it draws the picture of like my thoughts exactly because you've got to be able to have that growth asset to be able to then transition because if you don't have the growth you're not going to be able to get there you're not going to be able to get that higher cash flow. How how are, you, how are you finding Bushy? I'm going to steal that term rationalize by the way rationalize the portfolio. That's that's the generally the biggest discussion I have to have with people of how they're actually going to do that. Are they going to sell the whole portfolio, half of it? Are they going to re-leverage it and use that kind of leveraging to, to go again? It's that, That's the hardest conversation for me because you don't know a lot of the times. It's 20 years down the track. Yeah, yeah and it is. It, it, exactly right. You, you can't nail that right now, but but there are some very key things that you can take advantage of. So uh, depending on what income stream the particular investor is looking at and what the size of their portfolio is and the yield they're getting from their existing portfolio, what I normally suggest is that you start doing a progressive sell down uh, because what, what you don't want to do is uh, do a massive sell down of the portfolio in one financial year because you'll get absolutely clubbed with capital gains tax. What you need to do is spread it out over a series of years and do it when your earned income is starting to decline anyway so that uh, if your earned income is coming back and then you do have a capital gain, then it's the, you're not going to give most of it away to the tax man. So there's a, a progressive, you know, over a five-year period pre and post the time when you're not going to work full-time anymore, that, that's when you start doing the rationalisation. And you've got to look at the assets on their merits at that point in time. There might be a couple of them that are worth keeping because they're still giving you really strong yields. If, if so, great, you eliminate the debt and hang on to those. Or you you turn them over and, and then progressively put them into higher yielding assets like commercial property and, and index funds um, as an easy way of making that happen. Yeah, you so, might even have some early on in the growth cycle as well. So you get yeah. those for another five years and get the growth out of them, then sell them. Totally. Yeah, given that S-curve exercise, you'll find properties that go through a growth spurt and if they're not likely to see any massive growth beyond, providing you do a cost-benefit analysis on the changeover costs because they're not, they're not small changeover costs, and this is the the ongoing monitoring. It's just it's like running a business. You you have an annual business planning session. You need to treat your portfolio exactly the same way to see how things are performing. And I and I've said to a number of investors in recent times who have had what I would class as underperforming assets who just happen to be carried along by the the massive capital growth that's happening across the country. Now's the time to get rid of those assets. I, I've I've sold a couple of um, properties myself this year that uh, for some of my, the early properties we had, because we're moving into that cash flow zone in any case, but I'm getting uh, you know value on those properties that, that I wouldn't normally not see for those properties that we bought early in the, early in the piece. So that's the, that's the key part there. How does that then fold down into uh, the rest of the equation? Well, this, this is where the, the principles and the process need to kick in. And uh, again, I'm, I'm a shocker for acronyms, but uh, <laughs> I, I like to use the 
the uh, you've heard of preventative health. I talk about preventative wealth. And preventative wealth is about taking daily vitamins that are going to sustain your health long term. No different in property. If you break vitamins down into uh, its each component, these are the eight key principles I think all investors need to adopt and, and tick off when they're working through it. So the first three are the things that most people focus on. That's the value of the property that they can achieve. It's yeah. the rate of growth or the interest rate of growth that they, they're likely to get. And it's the time horizon they're looking to hold the property. They're the three things that most people will spend a bit of energy on. The, the last five principles, which I call the sustainability principles, uh, A is for affordability. So that's really getting clear on exactly how much a particular property is going to either put in or take out of your pocket every week before you've signed on the dotted line. So you, you do the homework beforehand, not afterwards. You need to have your mindset right. So this is all about your expectations, your self-belief and your belief in what, what you're doing. You, you need an income to create an income. This is, you know, again, I see a lot of spruikers sort of trying to convince people to jump off the employment cliff into full-time property development. Well, that's great until you go and talk to a bank. So you, you need to sustain a level of income while you're building the portfolio that will replace your income. N is for network, which is, you know, you've heard that old expression that your uh, network is your net wealth. That's So how good are people you surround yourself will have a big impact on the end result. And as I say, you're not a player, you're just the manager of the team. So that's about having elite independent professionals in every aspect of your property team. And then the last one, and it's last but definitely not least, is having a very clear strategy. And then applying a six-step process. So it's, the process starts with why. So that gets really clear on your vision. But we then need to counter that with examining what your capacity is. So we then uh, look at what your actual capacity is. That th Both of those inform the strategy you need to develop. Then you surround yourself with a team that's going to make it happen. And then and only then do you look at the properties that are going to, to fit that strategy. And the final component of that process is on a regular basis, do a health check of your portfolio. So every 18 months to two years, you're, you're revisiting the whole equation and making sure it's doing the right things and potentially going again. So it's a circlic process that, that's a, you know, yeah. it's a cycle of growth. Essentially, if you combine those eight principles in that six-step process, then uh, that gives you a very sustainable portfolio approach. So that part of it's key. Uh, if we, if I put a little bit of a shape around that, uh, again, what you're seeing on screen here is the vision board that Sonia and I put together over 20 years ago. I'm a very visual communicator, so I put everything on that vision board that is important to us. So family, travel, um, a mad hockey player, uh, mad muso. I uh, had some financial goals in there as well. Uh, and I've, I've, in fact, I've still got it on the wall behind me. You can see it, see it on the yeah, wall. Yeah, I was thinking. Back I was, behind me there. Uh, uh, that's just subliminally keeps me focused on what's important. I get really excited about it. Every time I see it, I, I get quite excited about it. And, and interestingly enough, just about every square on that board has been ticked over the 20 years. What's so the, the only one that I haven't done yet is singing with Sting. <laughs> so if anyone out there knows Sting and can get me in front of him, uh, I'm pretty keen to grab a microphone and sing alongside him. <laughs> so What's uh, with the guy at like the six tile with the backwards hat? What's going on there? The Which one? The... The backwards hat DJ looking guy next to you two in the photo. That's my son. He's a drummer. <laughs> <laughs> He's a muso as well. He, that's him playing drums, mate. So, uh... <laughs> but, uh, but and again, I only showed that there because uh, I think people need to get pretty crystal clear on that, on that vision. And that's just an example of what we do. Then we need to monetize it. So you, the, the, the process that we adopt for ourselves and, and other people that we help with this is to do the, the freedom numbers. And we start by, by looking at if you do nothing differently to what you're currently doing, where you're going to end up. So the, the key freedom numbers here are what's the lifestyle income that you're looking to create? So, you know, I, I've done a fair bit of research on this. If, if you're going to have a very comfortable lifestyle, which means some overseas travel and a decent car, a decent house and, and you know, really enjoying life, Assuming you've got no debt at the time you're in that position, then 120 grand a year will comfortably give you that. Uh, if you're if the the timeline is 20 years, then the nest egg number at 120 grand at a five percent return means you need to accumulate about 2.4 million dollars worth of assets. 
Then, then what we do is look at, okay, what have you already got? So in this case, we've got someone who's got 215 grand's worth of super and about 55 grand's worth of cash. We project forward based on the average growth rates of that over the last 10 years and then subtract inflation from it to get to what the net asset base will be in 20 years' time. In this case, once we've created the nest egg, and I'm assuming you're not going to spend the nest egg, you're just going to live off the proceeds that come out of that nest egg at a 5% return, that's going to give them... 33 grand a year to live on. So for most people, that's going to be well short of where they need it to be. But if we take it to the next level and we look at, okay, what's the gap? Then the gap in 20 years' time to meet that 2.4 level is 1.7 million. But if we cascade that back, you know, from the 20 years and take inflation off that figure to what does it mean right here, right now, today, then in this case, that individual's 878 grand short of where they need to be. And in property terms, that's that's one or two properties. Yeah, a couple of assets. So yeah. from a freedom numbers perspective, again, get clear on the vision, work out what that lifestyle income is, determine what your break-free timeline is. Very easy then to work out the nest egg number, project forward what your current asset base is. That'll tell you what the gap is and trickle it back to today. And that tells you roughly in terms of either a net figure or an indicative number of properties, the the position that you need to start from so that's always where we say and we always keep measuring back against that and uh, as, a, as a result of that, that that gives you the summary there of the, the freedom numbers in that context and, and then that's like your one pager to look at yeah exactly well and again I, I like to keep things visual and very simple so again you print this off you have it have it stuck on the wall you've got that re referred to as a magnet and a compass to make make sure that you're on track as far as that goes and it gives you something to measure it against when you revisit on a regular basis. So once yeah. we've gone through that, uh, coming back to the uh, cash flow curve again, we can pinpoint where we are. And once we know where we are, it's very clear on what we need to do from there. And we just keep tracking how we're going against that growth curve to see how the asset base is performing. So, so uh, can you can you give us a high level overview again of um of the previous previous slide just to kind of like how would you how would you summarize this um yeah this one here um in a in a couple of sentences to just just to kind of explain it simply for some of the people that yeah. may have missed that initial point so if we've worked out what someone's net asset position is and let's say in this case uh they 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 know they they're trying to reach four million dollars in in assets over a 20 year timeline which will which will effectively give them 200 grand a year in in passive income of that 5% return then it's very easy to to look at what the current net asset value of your assets is and that's the combination of your investment properties your shares your super and and cash mm -hmm. to pinpoint it on that curve and if it's not at the level it needs to be you need to keep focusing on growth if you've reached that nest egg level, in this case, let's say four mil is the nest egg level that we need to be achieving, that's at the point that we start rationalising the portfolio and transitioning it across into cash flow assets at that time. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, perfect. Perfect sense. Yeah. Now, I, I course, imagine as well, Bushy, where you've got a pretty, like it plateaus quite quickly for people that may not just be retiring, then going just to two or three days a week, that can be a bit more kind of linear. Yes, it can. Quite right. Yes, it can. Dead right. And again, this is what I say. There is no one size fits all here. It's all about what the individual's needs, desires and capacity is as well, because this is where the next step is, okay, well, we've worked out what you need to do, but what can you do? And yeah. I, I read, again, another really bad acronym. I, it's all about the bare facts. So the, the bare facts are how much can you borrow? How much equity do you have in terms of savings or uh, equity in existing properties? The third part is, uh, I think, the most important one, which is how much can you afford? And this is that ongoing holding cost that I'm talking about. So this is the how much per week is a particular asset costing you or putting you in, in your pocket? And do you have the right risk structures around this to protect yourself in the advent that something happens. So, so, so around uh, that that affordability aspect, do you say, well, I make X amount of dollars and I save, let's just say, $2,000 a month. So that means I have $2,000 of net 
cash flow that I am able to, that's my number. I'm able to get rid of $2,000 worth of negative cash flow to be able to hit my affordability number. So what is going to get me to that point? Yeah, and the affordability piece here is really, Joe, is looking at a particular proper op op opportunity and doing a detailed uh, cash flow analysis based on every conceivable worst case cost to both acquire and hold on to that property to look at what the true uh, weekly cash flow is for that property. And if that's if that number is affordable in the context of your your net income position, great. If it's not, don't touch the property. And it's it's not just the, the affordability today, it's the affordability this year, next year, year three, five, 10, 15, 20, however long you're holding the property, do join projections to get some confidence around what the ongoing affordability and the cash flowing of that property is going to be to make sure that it is going to be sustainable. Everyone's affordability is different though as well. I get asked, oh, what, what should I have for this property? And I go, well, I don't know how many kids you got. What's, how much, how much in more poverty line are you at the moment? Like I'm, I'm different. I'm no kids, good, good income, good property portfolio. I can take risks, but if you've got some dependents and things like that, you need to be mindful. Absolutely. So it, it, and this is where it is a very personalized exercise. It's not a one size fits all drill and it will change over time. So we need to accommodate in those projections if, as you say, Steve, if uh, they're single now, but they're going to have kids in three or four years, well, what impact is that going to have on their cash flow affordability? And is the property that they're looking at securing based on the cash flow projections for that property, is that is that going to be sustainable? So it's a, it's a really key component as far as, because most people, again, they just look at the borrowings and the equity. They don't really spend a lot of time looking at the ongoing affordability. And that's why they uh, end up shipwrecking themselves three or four years in selling the property and and never coming back to it. So that part's can that's key. That that again summarizes that. So once we know the borrowings in the equity, and again, I see far too many investors when they're looking at the financing of their the properties focus on rate rather than reach. And I call I call it reach because the biggest asset you have as an investor when you're borrowing money is is the borrowing capacity that the banks are going to give you. And there's a there's a over a fifty percent variation across the banks in terms of what they'll let you borrow based on exactly the same financial position. So when I see investors and banks and brokers running around talking about rate, they're missing the point. Yeah, because you might get the cheapest rate ever, but if they if another bank's going to effectively let you borrow double that amount, and that's 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 not unusual with some of the lenders that are out there. Yes, you might pay a slight rate premium for that. But if that allows you to secure a much bigger asset base, and then even at the same growth rate over the time, you're going to end up with a much bigger nest egg at the end of the journey. And then what, what type of, because we're, now we're talking about first tier, second tier, third tier lenders. When you're, yeah. when you're just starting out, um, should you be going for like the, the top tier, the, the, the more affordable rates, um, or some of these second tier, third tier going straight to them? Well, I just wouldn't be scared of looking second tier lenders personally. You know, they're, they're just as credible. They've got just as deeper pockets and they're generally their capacity and their appetite is a lot stronger than the, than the big four. So uh, yeah. it, it, in particular in the current environment where APRA is, is keeping a very close eye on the, on the big four, uh, not, not the same scrutiny for the second tier lenders. I think you'd be crazy not going down that direction because potentially your buying capacity is going to be substantially higher, which will get you into a higher value property, which of the same growth is going to give you a much higher nest egg. So buying capacity is a piece that, again, I just don't think enough investors focus on. They just focus on that you know, single denominator and that's the rate. Uh, you get the borrowings right, get the affordability right. That tells you what your you know, actual property purchase power needs to be so it mightn't be the maximum what you can do because that affordability piece needs to guide that and if we structure the properties in the right fashion they should be at mm -hmm. or slightly positive cash flow so it's not going to impede your salary savings or lifestyle while you're holding on to the thing yeah, so this speak, is this scrap speaking that to a, i was gonna say speaking to a good mortgage broker that's that's the difference between a good one and a bad one uh, a bad one would just go get you the cheapest rate you can find a good one will ask you What's your five-year, ten-year plan, and then decide based on that. Spot on, yeah. Steve. Absolutely spot on. And unfortunately, the the banking industry, and and you know, I don't want to denigrate the breaking industry. That there are some very good brokers out there, but there are some some real seagulls. 
they they fly in, shit fly out, and you never hear from them again. And all they do is sell you the cheapest rate loan that they can get their hands on. And if it's not structured well, it's not giving you the capacity you need. You're you're actually hamstringing yourself as a consequence of that. Hey, um, Sorry. Steve, in in the work that you do, do you come across a lot of clients that tie themselves up in these type of knots um, from a finance perspective? It's almost every investor, Joe. You've probably done it yourself as well, and you get the cross collateralization. Lock it in rates, things like that. It, it's always the okay. case. Finance is always the be. I just saw one of the Facebook comments. Finance game is key. It is. It's. I I underestimated it the first few properties I bought. It should be your main focus at the start. Yeah, I've I've, I've said this for years. Property is a game of finance. I mean, you, you get that yeah. part right, and it in terms of the capacity that gives you. And if you structure it well, you're also you can also do it in a way that's really minimising the risk then the, the strategy and the structure around the financing is absolutely critical to your success as a property investor. There's, there's no, it's the reason why we got into the broking area because I realised early in my own personal uh, uh, property investment career just how important the financing was and hence thought, right, well, we're going to add this to the complement because I really want to understand how this finance works. So uh, that's really key. The, the obvious thing here that I'm just, again, I'm, I'm preaching to the converted, but it's worth saying, uh, I really do encourage investors to be borderless in their outlook because if we're looking at the maximum growth over the duration uh, and given that 80% of the growth comes from the location, not from the property itself, then taking a, taking a national view of that means that you know, just a very small difference in the growth rate over the long term can have a massive impact on the size of the equity at the end. So in this case... You know, uh, the, the example I pulled out of the book there, a 3% differential in the growth rate over 20 years uh, on a $400,000 starting point will, will give you an extra eight hundred grand in equity at the end of the game. That's a 75% increase just by focusing on a higher average growth over that, over that time frame. So the, the, the rate of growth in the time frame has a massive impact on the end results. Excellent. So, and that, that's also borrowing, right? You, you'll be able to withdraw some equity at that point to be able to then purchase another property and then another one and, and continue down that path. Otherwise, you're just going to be stuck at this, this dart asset. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and I guess the, one of the key take-homes there is don't just focus on properties in your own backyard because there's mm -hmm. over 15,000 suburbs across the country and the likelihood of you living in the highest growth zone at your a purchase point is unlikely. You might get lucky, but it's yeah. highly unlikely if you take the blinkers off and look further afield and diversify your portfolio so that you're you're also, uh, if you've got properties in different states and different areas, then you're not putting all your eggs in one basket and you're also minimising the impact that land tax will have on the, the cost equation uh, rather than concentrating all your properties in one one area. The, the, the other thing I just want to sort of finish on really is the that in terms of the property search process, and again, I need to stress, I'm not a buyer's agent. We, we get buyer's agents to do the hard work on this for us. But it's very much once we've helped clients understand what their affordable spend is, that's the starting point, then it's about finding the highest growth three or four bedroom home on a block of dirt around the country. So we go from spend, we then synchronise it with what's happening with the national property clock and the buyer's agents are all over this uh, in terms of finding that. So we synchronise that. Then we go from the state level to the suburb level to the street level and finally to the property. So the property is, again, the last thing that you focus on because all of the growth is coming from the location rather, from the, rather than the property itself. So, so they're, the, they're, the, they're really the key components there. That, that was, they were the, the major parts I just wanted to cover off because it all comes under that strategy piece. So, you know, just as a summary, I guess, get clear on exactly how you want to live monetize that. that, that dictates your freedom numbers. Once you're clear on your freedom numbers, we then need to look at your capacity through the bare facts to look at what you can do. And between the two, we can move from where we are now to closing the gap to where you want to be in, in the timeline to, to fund the lifestyle that uh, you've already got clear on your head is the way you want to live on going. Does that, does that make sense? Spot on. 100%. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, that might be a better view. Um, I'm interested around the, the, the spend side of things. Um, how long does it take? Well, maybe not how long does it take, but what kind of variations are there between in prices when you're like, okay, I've got to work out the spend for my, cl or for the, 
for this person or this person has to work out the spend for themselves. Does it look like um, like uh, uh, it's between 400 and 420 or is it like 400 and 600? Like what kind of gap is there? Uh, it, it varies very much by the client again, Joe. Mm. So uh, what, what we will normally do is we'll establish the upper threshold based on the those bare facts I spoke about. So borrowing's equity will determine purchase price pretty much. So that'll that'll tell you the upper upper level barrier, yeah. and then a good buyer's agent will take that and go right. Okay, well if we can spend five hundred grand, then I, I know the 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 growth locations around the country that are likely to uh, support that for a three or four bedroom home. Mm -hmm. So it's it's really weak. A, a good buyer's agent is absolutely critical to the success of this once we get down to the property delivery side of the equation you need a really good buyer's agent who knows their stuff who who takes a data-driven approach to it as well rather than gut feel uh, to make sure that they are finding property solutions that are going to fit your strategy yeah um what we'll do we'll jump into we'll jump into well you've got it there questions <laughs> we'll jump into some of the questions so everyone who's on here now we've got a whole heap of people we've got 50 people watching this which is um when it gets to this point usually <laughs> we don't have this many people so guys if you if you've uh oh they're, they're streaming in okay great pop in your um questions below and um we can cover some of them some of them off but one of the things now this might just seem like a bit of a a bit of a silly question but let's just say you go to the you go to a mortgage broker like yourself, right? And you say, um, sorry, you go to the bank and the bank's like, well, you can borrow $700,000. Does that mean you should borrow the full $700,000? Um, and also, does that mean that's all I can borrow forever? It means that I need, if I'm going to hit my goal, I need three properties that one needs to be 300, 300 and um, 100 or can you talk to that? This is, now, now I'm, I'm verbalizing. I'm like, this is just a stupid question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I've, I've got to say, I'm a little bit confused about what the question is there, Joe. But uh, the, my, I guess my, my, my take on what you're saying there is once you know what your buying capacity is, and, and again, we, we need to balance buying capacity and equity because yep. you might be able to go to a bank and they'll say, yep, you can borrow a million bucks, but if you've yep. only got 10 cents in equity, you can't you can't buy anything. Conversely, you might have hundreds of thousands of dollars in, in equity in an existing property that you can access to put towards a property. But if your employment, your income and your liabilities are such that you can't borrow much, you, you snook it as well. But the, the key thing here is, again, it comes back to what does the end game look like? What What is the gap that we're trying to fill? And then, uh, so if you can borrow 700, but you ultimately need to be doing 1.1 to achieve your long-term goals based on that freedom forecast, yeah. then then uh, it can be one property at 700. Yes, it can. Or it could be two at 350. Again, I, I don't think it, it's not as simple as saying, right, you just go and buy a $700,000 property because yeah. you may find two really good properties at 350 that still have all of those growth drivers behind it and can still be structured so that it is cash flow neutral or or not dragging too much out of, your, out of your pocket, then that might be a better solution than a $700,000 property that's only yielding at 35 or 4% and is dragging a couple of hundred dollars out of your pocket, which is going to limit your ability to go again. So the, there's, this, there's this balance here. And the, and the, the, the challenge, I think, again, uh, that there's a lot of focus on getting blue chip properties as close to the city. That was, that was in my view, that, that's a, almost a, a pre-COVID solution. I think yeah. the COVID has really mixed that up a bit. So I don't think it's quite as applicable mm. as what it used to be. It's the, you know, the Bernard Salt talked about, we used to have the the fried egg where the the uh, yolk was the CBD and the white was the surrounding suburbs. And the idea was to get as close to the yolk as you could. Well, COVID has created scrambled eggs. We've got scrambled eggs now that <laughs> spread right right through the regions and through the, the, the outer areas, which has mixed up the opportunity. And the really good opportunity there, I think, is that there is a level at which if you spend too much money on the value of the property, the rental level is only going to get to a certain level. So you might have a million dollar property, but and if it's a, a three or four bedroom home, then a tenant is only going to pay so much for that, whether it's worth a million bucks or whether it's worth half a million bucks. So the balance here is to get the, the uh, purchase value of the property and the rental yield at a point where the property is going to cover itself once all expenses in. So it's not dragging a heap out of your pocket, but it's also got to have the key 
growth drivers to make that happen. So getting that balance is where a really good buyer's agent comes to the party because between the strategist, the mortgage broker and the buyer's agent, they should be able to crunch the numbers to give the investor confidence around how that's going to look before you buy the property. The key here is to build it on paper first before you before you commit and, and, and crunching those numbers in a lot of detail to have some confidence and clarity around that before you sign the contract. I've, I've always I've always slightly disagreed with the you need to buy in a CBD because that's where people work. But the people saying that are they're using the numbers from the 70s and 80s saying, oh, that's when we've had the best growth. The population of, say, Sydney, for instance, in the 70s was 2 million. Now it's over 6 million. So theoretically, I could say go buy Parramatta and the Bella Vista in the hills. The population of Western Sydney now is $2 million. So you could make the same argument saying buy in that CBD. It's spot on, spot on. And I, I, again, I, I think the big advantage of COVID is uh, if we look back, I, I, I like looking back at history because the only thing we learn from history is that we don't learn from history. If we look back at uh, the uh, after the First World War when the Spanish flu came through, uh, very similar conditions to what's happened with COVID. And for 20 to 30 years after the Spanish flu, there was a real exodus to the regions for the perceived safety and security which had a big impact on regional uh, property values over that over that stretch, and I think we're going to see the same thing happen here that we're already seeing, starting to see. There's some people debating whether, uh, as soon as COVID's gone, everyone will rush back to the city. I don't think they will because if you've sold up and moved, the changeover costs become their own handcuffs. So, uh, and providing the lifestyle benefits are there and the uh, the network infrastructure is there to enable you to to work remotely. I think uh, it creates a much better opportunity there. Any other questions there, Joe? There's lots of questions. I yeah, like this one, actually. Um, best piece of advice for a 20-year-old first-time investor? Yeah, that's a good question. That's a very good question. Um, uh, some, some really simple stuff there, uh, I think. If it's first time, uh, and, and th this is pretty basic information, but uh, save more than you spend. Uh, get invested early. So uh, if they don't have the deposit to get into property, then stick it into a, you know a safe vehicle like index funds or others that have got still pretty good strong growth attached to it without the risk. I wouldn't I wouldn't uh, go down the road I did. I I traded CFDs and they're highly leveraged and and highly volatile and and I think extremely risky. Uh, I was I was a bit dumb uh, and took some fairly major risk jumping into that 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 period of time sounds like the um, crypto of today yeah pretty yeah very very much so um and uh, beyond that i i i think i mean i i was a rent vester myself uh, again i i wasn't in my 20s i was because i was at ground zero in my 30s but we became rent vesters before rent vesting was a thing uh because I, I think the mistake that a lot of uh first timers do is they they put the yoke of a of their own owner occupied home around their neck which which prevents them from being out being able to invest so if it was me i'd be suggesting if you're living at home continue to do so yeah. or or board with some mates so that you're keeping your uh, rental costs down and put your capacity into uh in investing in assets that have got some growth and structure them so that they're not that they're going to be sustainable so I'm a big, big fan of rent vesting, both at the beginning of the journey. And, and, and let me be clear, we're going to be rent vesters at the end of our journey. That's where we're heading because I love to travel. So we've got all our assets creating their income for us. I don't want to be tied to this massive asset that is actually costing money in and nailing me to one place. I want to be able to travel freely but have the income from the, the uh, uh, portfolio that we've created yeah. that's, that's going to fund that. Yeah, well, it's exactly. We had uh, Chris Chris Gray on um, right at the beginning of the, the the group, and he was he was like pointing pointing out. He's like, "There's I, I wouldn't buy this property, but I love living here, and I just rent vest. It's a place I absolutely love, and there's no way I would want this negative yield asset. Um, but I get to live in this awesome place um, wherever you want to be. I love it. I think it's a it's a great philosophy at both ends of the ends of the spectrum. So uh, I, I often say that Australians have this this obsession with ownership. And uh, if we, uh, my view is invest in assets. So the, the only thing you own is is assets that are going to 
grow in value and access lifestyle. So things like, uh, you know, where you live and, and what you do, you know, don't buy a sports car, but if you go on holidays, rent a sports car for the weekend and enjoy the privilege of it because most of the time your sports car is sitting in the garage on blocks because you're too scared someone's going to scratch it anyway. So yeah. uh, it, it's about having the access but but putting all the ownership into, into uh, investments that are actually growing in value and giving you an income stream. Yeah, there was a question earlier that's sort of on the flip side of that. It's saying you mentioned excluding the family home from the nest egg, but if interest rates are low and there's accessible equity, should that be used slash taken into account in the freedom state? Yeah, you can. So you can certainly access uh, equity out of the uh, owner-occupied home to do that. But ultimately, you know, in my view, uh, and, and this is my, my own thinking around this, you use the investment portfolio to help you get rid of the non-deductible debt on the home loan faster than what you otherwise would if you were just ploughing money into it. And yes, if there's equity in it, you can utilise that, providing it's separated and standalone from the investment portfolio, so not putting the home at risk. Uh, you can certainly use the equity can contribute it to it, but ultimately... The whole exercise here is to end up with a freehold home. If, if you're going to be living in a place permanently, then we want to be investing in such a way that you have no debt against it and the home that you're living in isn't going to be giving you an income stream. So we, we need to, in my view, isolate it from it in terms of the calculations that we're making because it's the rest of your portfolio that's going to give you the income that you need. Yes, you can downsize, so you can free up some equity at that point in time and, and put the excess... Uh, sale proceeds from that from that home into something else and live in something more modest. You, you can certainly do that. So that, I, but I in my initial numbers, I generally exclude that because I'd rather be conservative in it to establish what we need to do, knowing that uh, if we kick that back in at the other end, then the position is actually going to be better. To, to play to play devil's advocate here, um, would you not want to have you know a PPOR with seventy percent leverage, and then you're using that to be able to go out there and purchase another cash flow asset that is paying you because it's not your your PPOR is not paying you, but the leverage that you've got from that asset is paying you. you would yeah, yeah, certainly you, you can use that to some degree, but we all know that because it's non deductible debt. Uh, what it tends to do is hamstring your capacity to do something else. Mm. So that's that's my biggest concern around that. And that, that's why when I was at ground zero in my early 30s, we, we deliberately became rent investors because we knew that the horsepower that we could get out of having all of our debt tax deductible meant that uh, from an actual cash flow perspective, we were better off by renting it at a far reduced cost than the mortgage would be on the place that we were actually renting at the time and putting our energy into growth assets that were giving us an income stream and all the costs associated with that property then became tax deductible and it was much easier to cash flow. Yeah, yeah, 100%. Makes, makes, makes perfect sense. And um, we've got one here. Um, I might need a magic pill on this one, but uh, how do you use equity without pushing your PPOR loan up? Uh, yeah, so you you don't touch your home loan. You create a separate, what we call a war chest. So if you don't have any other equity in other properties or savings, then uh, you create a separate equity loan, or we, we call it a war chest. So it's an interest-only equity loan uh, that, that does take advantage of some of the equity you've got in the home. Uh, but we do it in such a way that that is the uh, extent of the exposure on the owner-occupied property, and then the remainder of the debt is in a, preferably with a separate lender and on a standalone non-cross-securitized basis on the investment property you end up buying. So you have a, a home loan, which is non-deductible. You have a separate equity loan, which we call it the war chest. And the good thing about having a, an equity interest only component of that is that you're only paying interest on the amount you use. So if you're not using, it's not costing you anything. And it also needs to, needs to build in there at least three months and preferably six months worth of your living costs as a rainy day reserve. So if you get hit by a bus, you lose your job, uh, there's a, the, the property's vacant for a period or there's damage to the property, you've got very cheap reserves of funds to fall back on that aren't going to put you in a position where you need to knee jerk and do something stupid that, that will compromise what you're doing with your investment strategy. 
well answered. Fantastic. Okay, great. We've got got another one here. In regards to the wealth component on the cash flow curve, is a $1 million in asset consisted of borrowed cash that would be paid down to $0 by the time you rationalize the portfolio? Or can you uh, can it be in debt as, so as long as it's positively geared? Yeah, so uh, yeah, again, great question. Uh, uh, de it depends. So uh, <laughs> in, in a perfect world, yes, you'd, you'd uh, eliminate the debt. But th this is where it comes down to how big are the goals. So what what level of income you are looking to create. So some people are going to be happy on sixty grand a year, and other other people will want three hundred grand a year. And depending on what that is, so so that you know the your lifestyle taste and the lifestyle cost becomes a key component of this. So if it if it's humble, then and depending on what the timeline is, you may be in a position where you can eliminate all the debt. But if you don't, it's a matter of rationalising at that point in time and eliminating the debt. So you may do a sell down of a, of a portion of the portfolio to get rid of the debt and then put the proceeds into other high yielding assets, whether it be commercial property, index funds, you name it. So it's a, that's a bit of a furry answer. But, but uh, yes, potentially you can eliminate the debt, but it doesn't have to be the goal. The goal is to focus on the equity growth and then we can eliminate the debt in that transition process from the growth to the cash flow component. Yeah. How, how do you kind of see it um, on, the on the commercial side of things when, they, when customers make that, they're in that transition phase to move on to the commercial side of things, Steve? Um, yeah. Yeah, it's going to depend what type of loan they get. But yeah, you can get the cash flow when you're leveraged with commercial. But at some point, you're going to have some form of pay down strategy. A bank, when you're 75 years old, is not just going to let you have $5 million worth of debt with it coming in. So yes, there's lease loans and things like that. But at some point, you'll taper off. If you've got a 200 grand passive income and you're living off 100,000 and you've got P&I loans, it's naturally going to pay itself off pretty quickly anyway. Like you've said before in the little advertisement, pays itself off in 10 to 12 years kind of thing. So over five years, your 70% LVR will drop to 50, 45%. The next five years, it'll go down to 20%. So you're naturally going to, it's going to be a taper effect. It's not going to be a sharp, this is the date I retire and nothing else happens. And then yeah. like Bushy said, if you've got a few residential properties, you, you stage them, you sell one and then you pay off and you go from 60% to 40% and you sell one later on and, but it's all down to the individual. If they've got income coming from other investments and things like that, you can handle the debt. If you're a high risk person, you've got your grandkids and you need it needs to be secure, then a lower LVR is obviously the best option. Yeah, yeah perfect. I've just I've just looked at the time and we're on here for nearly two hours. So, um, <laughs> so I haven't even given you guys an opportunity to just be like, oh, I want uh, so it's time to, it's time to go right. now. Um so let's let's answer. Um, are there any other questions there, Steve, that you can see that um, you want to put on? I want to put up this one. I'd love your thoughts on this one, Bushy, um, because it's got you know. I love the point that Joe made, uh, <laughs> but it would be good to get your thoughts on on this. Yeah. Okay. So, what's really would you adjust to someone on a low fifty percent income, touching on preferable loan structuring, low risk appetite? Yeah. Okay. So, I, I'd definitely be shopping around in terms of lenders on that income because, as as I mentioned, there is uh, between a fifty and sixty percent variation across the banks in terms of what what they'll let you borrow. So, definitely yeah. don't just restrict yourself to the big four. I would go well beyond that. There's some great second tier lenders out there that'll give you a much higher borrowing capacity. So that'll that'll help in terms of the you know the asset size that you you can secure, and then in terms of structuring, uh, what I what I tend to favour is what I refer to as a, a standalone multi lender structure. So what do I mean by that? Uh, I mean that uh, we want to be putting a a firewall between the owner occupied home and the investment property, so that and and preferably. Make sure that if you've got a home loan with a lender against your home, you use a different lender on one or more of your investment properties. So no one bank has full control over the whole portfolio. That's absolutely critical. Yeah. And then, uh, so standalone, no cross securitization, multiple lenders starts that in, in uh, immediately builds in some risk containment. But it also maximises your borrowing capacity depending on which which lender you're talking to, 
And then additional factors that I weave into that, uh, again, from that risk protection, is that rainy day reserve in the war chest exercise that I spoke about. But also make sure you bolt on offset accounts onto every loan that you have, not just the home loan. Why do I say that? Because uh, initially you want to be ponding as much of your funds into the offset account against the home loan to, to effectively neutralise or get rid of that as quickly as you can. But also, depending on how good your accountant is, and I'm not an accountant, so this is not financial advice in any way, shape or form. But if you've got uh, – once you start paying an investment loan down – then uh, technically from the tax office perspective, uh, they'll only ever let you claim the reduced balance. So if you keep an investment loan fully drawn and you have surplus funds ponding in the offset account once your home loan's been extinguished, then you've still, you've still got the ability to, if you re redraw those funds out of the surplus and put it towards another property, you've still got full claimability on that investment loan that you wouldn't do if you'd started to actually pay the loan down. Does that make sense? So never fully yeah. pay it down to, to Yeah, if you, to if you just start, let's say you eliminate the home loans, like, great, now I'm going to start paying down my investment loan. Yeah. Uh, the issue there is that two things. One, as soon as you start paying it down, you're reducing your tax deductibility, and that, that's not the only reason for doing it, but you are reducing it. And uh, if you pull the money back out and put it towards another property, the, the ATO, if they do an audit, it's going to say, well, hold on, uh, you've paid down that loan. We're only going to let you claim that amount. If the loan's fully drawn, but you've got surplus funds sitting in the offset account and then you pull money out of the offset account, you've had no impact on your ongoing tax deductibility. So, so what, what do you of, if you've got, say, four properties, will you, say, have an offset for each of them and spread the risk? Because yeah. I've, I've personally always just put it in the, the one with the highest interest rate because I'm like, oh, that's going to give me the best net return. Yep, which makes perfect sense. And I, I the, the other thing that I would, I would suggest... Because uh, I've, I've seen a lot of people uh, in recent times jumping into switching everything across to P&I because it's got a lower rate. And the the issue with that is that you're paying a little bit off everything, but you're never going to own anything. What I would prefer to do is decide which property you want to own first. So let's say the home is the one you want to own first. So we keep that P&I, keep everything else interest only, and we any surplus goes into smashing that out. Once that's gone, then we look at, okay, what's the next property that we want to actually have freehold ownership on? And it's likely to be the one that's got the best yield. Then we'll switch that to P&I and we'll do the same thing. We'll start ploughing everything, any surplus into knocking that loan off and keeping the others interest only, mm -hmm. rather than all interest only, cheaper rate, but only pay a little bit off and never own anything versus mm -hmm. progressive ownership by switching from interest only to principal interest at the time that we're starting to actually smash holes in that particular property. Yeah. Does that make and sense? And also increase your borrowing capacity there as well. Yes. Um, Spot on. And, and this is, like we said, finance is the most important piece of the puzzle. You can see already, like, I had a differing strategy to you and you've just saying that. I'm like, oh, maybe I should change my strategy. <laughs> <laughs> well again there's, it's, there's no one size fits all and it all comes a bit down to the sleep at night factor for the individual too by the way i can sit here and pontificate on on things that you should do but if it's going to keep you awake at night don't do it yeah no, 100 right. um guys i appreciate you were both taking so so um so much time energy and effort bushy you've been doing a lot of talking i think this is the best one to uh to pop up here um, and you've gone through so much about property strategy today and gone so deep. Um, but how can, um, how can people get in touch with you? How can they learn a little bit more about, uh, about Bushy? Uh, yeah, well, two, two easy ways. Uh, I've got a personal website, bushymartin.com.au. Uh, if you are looking for any support and assistance around the property piece, then reach out to us at knowhowproperty.com.au. Uh, Feel free to email me at bushy at knowhowproperty.com.au. Uh, it may take me a couple of days to get back to you because uh, like everyone in the industry at the moment, we're absolutely flat out. But shoot it through and one of the team will come back to you. But uh, what I suggest you do is uh, uh, come and have a join me on the Get Invested podcast. Have a listen. Uh, I also yeah. host the Realty Talk Show that used to be Kevin Turner's uh, real, real estate talk show. Kevin sort of stepped out of the chair and he's been brave enough to let me loose on the microphone. So, uh, and every week I'm talking to uh, some fantastic people, uh, a bit like the Steve Polisi sitting here that uh, we've had on <laughs> yeah. a couple of times yeah. already. When's that episode coming out? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, 
that's already been out, mate. You've missed that one. So, oh, uh, it's already been jump- out. <laughs> <laughs> There's a really good community there as well. And I get to talk to some great people in the industry about uh, some great topical uh, uh, property, uh, yeah, some current stuff that we're talking about in that regard. So they're, they're probably the best places to jump, jump on, get invested, have a listen to us yeah. on Realty Talk. And then if we can uh, be of any support to you another way, just feel free to reach out. I'm on a, on a mad mission to wake up and shake up as many of the Australians as I can to see the benefit in getting invested because uh, those that don't are going to, uh, their lifestyle will fall off the cliff when they try to stop work. So uh, never been a, a better time or a greater opportunity to take advantage of the times that we have. Definitely. It's very much to, to do that one step that one step back to be able to take a massive leap forward. You've got to start with the strategy and that plan. Um, Steve, you've been a fantastic, uh, fantastic co-host. I, yeah. I don't know if we'll get Steve. Um, we, I don't think we'll get Jeff back on, mate. Yeah. <laughs> I, was, I, was even <laughs> say, I don't know if we'll get Steve back. I'm like, geez, say that behind closed doors. Oh, <laughs> yeah, at least end the at least end the session live. Uh, at least end the session. Um, but how can how can people get in touch with you, mate? I know uh, we kind of had that slide before, but give us uh, give us a bit of a rundown. Just shoot me a Facebook message. You see my Noz property investors commenting constantly, so just click me and send me a message, and I'll respond. And I, I want to thank you both. I've, I've really, I mean, you've, you've got me talking about my favourite subject, as is pretty clear. <clears throat> I could talk about this all night, but uh, really enjoyed uh, talking to you both. And uh, I, I want to thank you. I feel very privileged to come on board and uh, have a chat with you and uh, and the rest of the community. You've, you've creating an awesome community, guys. Uh, take my hat off to you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it was great to have, you know, absolute legends like yourself, um, you know, both both of you to be able to share your experience and, and in the group and just help people grow and get better at property investing so they don't make the mistakes that I've made at the beginning. And I'm sure that you both have. But um, yeah, awesome, guys. Thank you very much. Okay, guys. See you later. Let's, uh, well, let's thanks, go Joe. buy a property. Thanks, Steve. <laughs> see you later. <laughs> thanks.